everyone hear me, Alan? That's better. That's better. Still, That's better. still a little weak, but it's better. Is this even better? A little bit better now? Yeah. <clears throat> I think if other people also mute, uh, uh, they're not talking, that would be helpful for audio quality for the person who has the floor as well. Yeah, Kara, I think we can uh, we can actually mute everybody when we get going too. Yeah, and I think the to start, we might just want to go over some protocol procedure for the mm -hmm. online meeting. This is Maggie Summer. If anyone has GoToMeeting specific tips on the webcam, I, I'd take them. Mine works fine with other applications, but it's telling me I don't have a webcam available now, although I can see myself. Maggie, are you using, um, when you joined, did you choose to use the web-based option or use the um, uh, app option? Web-based. It, Not it could so be, yeah. the experience I've had in the past is that the browser you're using hasn't had permission to use your webcam. I'm not sure how to actually allow the browser. So um, that might be the, the problem. Great, thanks. I think if, I think if you uh, search video, it'll take you to a, um, an option where you can associate the video to the to go to meeting. I had to do that for my microphone. Great, thanks. What do you think, Adam and Carrie? It looks like we have 31 attendees. It hasn't increased for a little while. Um, I know Angel is going to be a little bit late. She had another call this morning. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, probably best we get going. I was waiting for, uh, cause I thought there was gonna be a few commissioners joining, um, but they may be on a schedule, so we can get going with, with what we've got now. Okay, um, this is fair. Should, uh, should we shut off our webcams unless we wanna say something? Is that the deal? Yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll go through some of those uh, protocols now. So uh, leave it on or turn it off. For, uh, for the time being, we'll just run uh, what I will do is mute everybody though while we get started. Okay, uh, well, good morning, everybody. It's really nice to see a number of you and hear folks. Uh, I hope everybody is keeping well. Um, and I'm glad to see that people have been able to, uh, to make this virtual meeting work so far. Uh, I think, maybe Alan can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first um, uh, virtual meeting of the commission or any of its uh, subsidiary bodies uh, since we've found ourselves in this current situation. So there, uh, there may be uh, a few hiccups along the way, but I really appreciate everyone's willingness to, um, to, to uh, I guess, be the guinea pigs the first go around. Uh, hopefully folks can see the agenda on the the shared screen, that's document 01. Um, before we get into the full agenda though, Carrie and Alan and I had talked about uh, trying to identify a few um, tips or suggestions about how we can best uh, work in the, the GoToMeeting platform. Uh, so as most folks have seen, there is um, a floating menu bar that has uh, your audio, visual, and uh, screen controls. There's also a chat function and a list of the attendees. I think most folks had a chance to experiment with those uh, features on Thursday, or if you've used uh, GoToMeeting in, in previous sessions. Um, the chat function is something that you can use both to talk to the entire group or individuals. Um, and so obviously you can, uh, uh, use that as the meeting goes on, but just be mindful about who you're, you're chatting to, because I think the default is to continue either talking to, the, the, always talking to whoever you spoke to last. Um, so that's, that's, it's going to be, at least I know for me, a bit of a struggle to, 
deal with all the, the multiple things that are popping up. If it's too much, you can just minimize all those options or, or turn them off. The substantive parts of the meeting of the session are going to happen uh, here with the audio recording and the, uh, the video. We're not going to be making decisions on the, the chat bar on the side. Um, one suggestion that we had uh, put forward was that the webcams would be turned off when uh, when we're not speaking. So the only webcams would be left on would be the co-chairs and uh, the secretariat. The idea then was that uh, it would help minimize any bandwidth issues. Um, although that said, I, I haven't noticed anything yet. So maybe turn over to the floor uh, or carrier Alan first to see if there's any thoughts about this this uh, webcam protocol the, the suggestion was we turn it off until you want to speak and you turn your webcam on and that would be a good way for us to know that you want to be added to the queue I, I, I think that's a good idea some may not have a webcam or it may not be working so um, feel free to use the chat um, window as well I'm monitoring that on the second computer um, and if you have something to say in the webcam and the chat's not working for you, just feel free to unmute and speak up and we'll put you in the queue. And I think Adam and Carrie, you'll keep a running list of whoever would like to speak. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so uh, first first step is to, to indicate your desire to speak by turning on your webcam and hopefully there isn't uh, too much of a queue and you could actually just start talking when your webcam's on. If your webcam is not functioning, then you can uh, indicate in the chat that there's um, uh, a question you'd like to be added to the list. Um, okay. Carrie, was there anything else you wanted to add to that? I think, I think that's all. Um, yeah, I think that'll be a good plan. And um, if we're going along and there's something about that plan that doesn't work, then we can make adjustments then. Okay, sounds good. Um, I guess the other piece is, does anybody have any any secret tips or, or things you found has worked well on this type of platform? Anything you want to share in, in a soundbite? I think I would, I would just say um, I've I've heard in the in the Zoom context that the while you're you know chatting with people say individually or sometimes with the group um, I've heard that that entire record is um, recorded and and disclosable so I'm just putting that out there for people if if you want to chat really privately you probably want to use uh, a text phone text. That's the case. I don't. Maybe maybe this platform doesn't keep keep a record. Well, that's a good point. I actually should look to clarify with the secretariat about how the session this session is being recorded. Normally, these meetings are recorded for posterity, but um, I'm not sure what parts of this session are being recorded. If we were in the uh, IPHT's office, you could step out in the hall to have a side conversation, but that's obviously not not possible here. I believe everything is currently being recorded. I don't think the chat functions are saved. I don't know if Alan or Dave could clarify that. Um, I know that all um, the go-to meeting itself is being recorded, so I know the audio is being recorded. I'm not sure if the video as well, but I, I well, actually, the screen sharing is definitely being recorded. I'm not certain about the chat window, but um, I think that you can assume that everything that goes in the chat window is um, is on the public record. Okay. All right, thanks for that uh, point, that clarification, Alan, and that tip, Jim. Um, one thing I will add is if you do have um, a, a separate audio, a headpiece and a microphone, I've heard that the sound is better uh, that way. Uh, for me, I use it because my three children are currently practicing karate and piano, I think at the same time, right above me. So this keeps it a little bit quieter. Um, I, I don't think we should have too much of an issue with background noise because we can, can mute everybody. But if we're having trouble hearing someone speak, uh, that's, a, that's a suggestion. Okay, any other points? 
Otherwise, I suggest that we uh, we move into the second agenda item, adoption of the agenda and any of the arrangements that we need to identify for the session. So um, this is actually probably a more substantive discussion than what we've had in past MSAB meetings in that obviously the agenda is uh, needed quite a bit of modification given the current uh, current circumstances. So as folks have noted, um, while the, the high level content of the agenda is still the same as what was posted uh, before we elected to move to a, a virtual meeting, the amount of time dedicated to individual items uh, has been cut back so that the sessions roughly are broken into a, a half day, a morning of presentations, and then uh, unscheduled or uh, undefined amount of time in, in the afternoon where folks could have uh, more informal discussions before we come back to report writing at the close of the day. Um, Alan, perhaps well, I should have shared my screen. Perhaps you could go to uh, today's timetable as a first example. Thanks. So you can see that um, we're, we're scheduled until about midday with presentations. Uh, the afternoon, if Alan scrolls down a little bit further, is where you see there's the unscheduled time and we'll circle back for, for report writing. So we do have some extended, uh, extended time for, for break. Uh, to be honest, I'm not clear about uh, how best we make use of that break time or how we might have these informal conversations, at least in my experience over the past, um, the past few years with the MSAB, some of the most constructive uh, time is usually when we're, we're talking during lunch break or coffee break and uh, th there isn't a single platform that, uh, that I've identified that would help facilitate those conversations. So if folks have any ideas, please share them. It'll probably be uh, um, something that's going to continue to evolve throughout the week. So um, are there what are folks' thoughts on the agenda? Are there things that we, we really need to change? Are there points of clarification that folks want to seek? I would agree with you, Adam, that um, that two hour break in the afternoon was specifically for people to collect their thoughts, to have side conversations. Um, I'm not sure how the Secretariat can assist in those conversations. Um, I believe this go-to meeting will remain open, um, but as I said, that is um, being recorded and anybody can join that, even the public members. Um, and, and so, you know, I encourage people to have those conversations. I'll definitely be available on the phone, email, et cetera. Um, and yeah, but if anybody does have a suggestion for what they would like to see for the day and how the day works, um, please let us know. Hey, Adam, this is Dan. Hey, Dan. Hey, I just had a question on like, what is the major outcome of this meeting? Because I noticed that um, if we're trying to basically review the results of the management procedures we identified back in October and firm those up for further work for this October. It seems most of that was just like an hour or two on Wednesday or Thursday. And I'm just wondering if that's still the main outcome or could you guys kind of recap where we are in the process and what you'd like us to get done at this meeting? Yeah, I, I can do that, Dan. Um, thanks for bringing that up. And I thought that would be a useful um, discussion to have while we're sort of uh, setting out this agenda is that the MSE team has been working very, very hard and we're really, really close to having the simulations going into production mode. However, we felt that at this time we do not have results that are meaningful and that would um, be useful to analyze at this meeting. So we, we're not going to have any real results of those actual management procedures to discuss and refine. So this meeting is going to have to focus on where we currently are at with the simulation modeling, um, the, the things that we have been doing to ensure you that the simulation modeling will be accurate and useful for this exercise um, in the coming year, 
and then to have a discussion, a longer discussion on those management procedures, make sure that we have um, the set of management procedures that, that the MSAB would like to see go forward, and then talk about the schedule for the remainder of the year, um, and in mainly how the SRB is going to fit in, um, and when results will be available, and how you'd like to review those results, if that's in October, the first time you want to see those, or if we have a release sometime in the summer, perhaps, of some preliminary results. Then just for just to clarify, I appreciate the modified schedule, um, and I appreciate the idea that we want to look at that list that you laid out in the table and in our 07 document and make sure that's what we really want to go forward. Have you run those exact scenarios, or you know, and if we were to change them, would we have wasted some work that's already happened, or where are we at in terms of um, the ability to kind of modify those? Yeah. Thanks, Dan. That's a really good question. No, I'd, I'd say that there's no time wasted. Everything that we have done thus far, we, we've um, the MSC team has written a lot of code to to perform those exact management procedures. So we have that written in code. It was just the bringing the whole thing together, have operating models that are working, connecting with those management procedures, and producing the right results. Um, there's a lot of little moving parts to this that we just didn't have all the pieces fitting together exactly. So if those were to change, it would be simple changes to our code. There would be nothing um, wasted. And we haven't actually done the real long simulations at this point in time. Um, so there wouldn't be any waste in, in changing those or tweaking those slightly. Um, but I, I would say within the next month, um, and we're hoping to bring some results to the SRB meeting in June, um, that will be running these longer simulations and um, starting to see how these distribution procedures are coming together. So this okay, is an thanks. That's really time. helpful. Yeah, this opportune time to to start, you know, to think about those again and tweak those a little bit. And I do apologize that we won't have the results to look at at this time. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks, Dan. So I see uh, Peggy's got a question, and Jim, Tom also had a comment in the chat, and I like to interject that because it's a follow-up for Dan, I think. So just understanding what the sequence of events is in terms of our timing requirements. Uh, Tom is concerned that the SRB is expecting uh, final results in September 2020. And so um, how do we align our recommendations with, uh, with what the SRB needs to provide some input on uh, going forward from there? So Alan, do you want to take the SRB piece afterwards like do you hear questions from other folks or do you have an answer for that now um what the, the short answer is and then we can follow up with that after we hear from folks is that the, the ms team is very aware in our timeline is to get those results by the end of august um for that initial look by the srb but of course you know things can change after that um and then we have to fit in the mse review as well in there so we're, we're looking to have our production runs pretty much um, preliminary runs done in August for those two reviews at the end of August. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Peggy? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I had the same thoughts that Dan did about uh, what the purpose of this meeting would be. And, and for a couple of reasons, I'd like to know if we need to have a summer meeting, and I'm more than happy to do a summer meeting, but I hope it would be um, productive. And now it sounds like it, a meeting prior to September um, may not be as productive, and since we're meeting in October. So if you have thoughts on that, if I've got the timing wrong, that would be good to hear from you, Adam or Alan or Carrie. Um, and then for this meeting, I was thinking about those kind of ad hoc conversations that we have. And if we do it according to the agenda, it would be important to be able to capture any, um, any productive results of those uh, in that day or shortly uh, in the next morning's recap to get it on the record. because. Um, for for agenda items that are coming up, we can do that when we come to that agenda item. But if it's for something that we've 
been discussing and then we sort of clarify our thoughts after we've moved on to the next agenda item, um, somehow it seems like we need to be able to recognize some progress or at least bring something up to, to discuss um, so that it, it may change the outcome. That's all I'm thinking. That's a really good suggestion, Peggy. Um, and if, if you got some suggestions about how best we can accommodate that, I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, two things that we had talked about, which uh, may get us partway there, is, uh, is first flagging uh, a check-in uh, before and after each break so that everyone has a, a chance to talk about um, what their sidebar conversations were in that time. Um, but the other piece was having some more um, dedicated time to each individual, similar to when we went around the room uh, after talking about objectives or management procedures and asked every person to speak. So put another way, rather than the co-chair saying, does anyone have any comments or questions? We would say, Peggy, what do you have to add? Chris, what do you have to add? Dan, what do you have to add? And giving every member a specific opportunity to speak. That, that works. I think we'll- It also puts of... folks on notice. Be prepared to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see how that works as we go, go through. Uh, yeah, um, like I said earlier, this is my fi first time doing this, and I think for a lot of other folks. So I will um, greedily accept any recommendations or suggestions folks have about how to do things differently, if there's a better way. Um, I see Chris uh, identified he'd want to speak, and I think Jim Lane had also turned on his webcam. Jim, would you mind going, and then Chris? Jim may be turning on unintentionally because I only see your knees. Uh, Chris, would you mind going then? This needs to be unmuted. I don't see Chris's webcam. Do you all see Chris's webcam? Can you hear me now? I can hear yeah, you now. I can hear you, Chris. Okay. Um, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to, um, so go ahead, Jim. I think Jim, Jim can go first. Jim's still muted. Um, Jim, I'm going to okay, unmute well, you. Yeah. On, or, well, I've unmuted Jim. Jim, can you talk now? Jim Lane? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we can hear you, Jim. All right. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so just, just to clarify my own mind, I was, um, cause you, you're not expecting any, you know, real results till, you know, later on. So to me, this is kind of more of a, you know, being able to go over and maybe a little more detail of those very technical papers, kind of like, you know, information from the secretariat about a lot of this stuff. And, you know, I, I kind of like, uh, Peggy's suggestion at some point later after we've been able to maybe, uh, think about it because um, you know, I, I find these long webinars as well. They may be, uh, you know, kind of things we have to do now. They are kind of challenging to sort of get your head together around a lot of stuff. On that note, I am a member of a worldwide organization that is lobbying for the ban of webinars longer than four hours. <laughs> Anyways, I like that, that last suggestion and sometime later, maybe in, there, maybe in June we can reconvene or at some point in time where we can kind of maybe think a little bit more about what you're saying. Uh, certainly, I think we're going to have some questions and stuff, but uh, some of, you know, a couple of those papers are really, you know, technical. We don't, you know, without results to look at, but it did appreciate you kind of scoping down some of the, the management procedures. You know, that does help your brain kind of, you know, bound some stuff and maybe uh, I think you're going to do this, but, you know, being able to sort of provide some, the rationale for kind of how you did that. I think you, you, you did that back in October, I think, to a certain extent. Um, and I, I, so when I saw him, I thought, okay, this is what he's done. Um, and it started to make sense to me even without seeing it. But so uh, thanks for that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thanks, Jim. So uh, I see Chris has also got some questions and maybe we'll wrap it up from there. Um, actually, maybe Chris go first, and then I'll, I'll provide a summary. 
Um, my comment was just uh, sort of similar to what Jim was saying, just in that uh, I'm, I'm still a little confused on what the process is going to be going forward. And, and uh, you know, we talked about information has got to go to SRB. Obviously, we want, want to have some uh, input before we, you know, we get final results or even results. So I, I think the suggestion earlier is something we all need to keep in mind. You know, we're going to get a lot of information this meeting. Um, we probably should, in our mind, be preparing and spend, uh, think about it and propose some plans that we, we may have to get together at some point in the summer um, if we want to be able to, to look at this and provide insight. So I'm just throwing that out there for the group that it's something I think we need to keep in mind. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so we, we've heard uh, a few similar points from folks around the room, and it's good to hear that folks are uh, one on the same page. Uh, by and large, and that we're um, thinking probably about similar solutions. So the the three points I've got scribbled down here is uh, affirming what some of the key deliverables are, the key takeaways from this meeting, um, and then given that those deliverables may not be the same as what we had anticipated delivering um, at MSAB 15 when the work plan was put together previously, do we need to revise the the work plan? Um, and perhaps identify some intersessional meeting before October 2020 to um, either provide more advice to the secretary in advance of SRB or for us to have an opportunity to provide some comment after digesting the quite technical papers that were put forward uh, for, for this meeting. So I guess the question is, uh, if folks are in agreement that we, that we need to do that, we need to identify what the key deliverable deliverables are we need to revise the work plan and then identify some uh, meeting before October 2020 do we do that during the dedicated program of work agenda item which is currently scheduled uh, for Thursday or do we need to have something a bit sooner I would suggest that we do it at the um, uh, later in the meeting so that we actually have a chance to see what's um, coming down the line on t today tomorrow uh, maybe Wednesday but if folks feel like that's waiting a bit too long, um, maybe we could have some of these informal discussions in one of the breaks in the afternoon and people could share their thoughts about when best to meet again um, uh, to probably tomorrow morning. I'm thinking folks probably want to, some folks will know, you know, July is not going to work because I'm fishing uh, or I already have obligations in June or, or something like that. Um, so what are folks' thoughts on that? Or actually, maybe I should go first to Alan. Like, what, what is the secretariat schedule in terms of when you're actually able to meet? Yeah, thanks, Adam. First off, I think um, holding off to have this more detailed discussion until that agenda item of the program of work might be helpful. That way we see everything that's currently up to point uh, or what's been done up to this point and where, where the MSC team and the secretariat think that we're going to end up and when we're going to end up there. Um, and then furthermore, uh, I just want to note that having meetings does take away time for us and the prep for this MSAB meeting, you know, is, is weeks of time. The prep for the intersessional commission meeting was a week of time, the annual meeting. It, it takes time that distracts from us getting the work done in the simulations. So I think July might be a little bit early to begin. Uh, thinking about this, but you know, in August sometime would be ideal from our viewpoint to be able to have some results um, done and some summaries of those results in some format. And I'm not sure the best format for that meeting, if we're to create formal documents for this meeting that are lengthy um, and have, you know, uh, worked out graphics and all, and all these tables and things, that's going to take a lot of time. If we're just to put together a more informal um, intersessional meeting, perhaps, and, and a, you know, Dave, feel free to chime in on this as well, that you know, it might allow us to continue our workflow, um, be able to provide an update to the MSAB, um, and then that gets captured in some sort of minutes in some way that then moves forward to the SRB and the Commission. Yeah, if I could chime in there, um, I, I would suggest that we run it very similar to how we run intersessional uh, meetings of the Commission itself. Uh, that process is, is now well defined and if there are specific needs for the MSAB to prepare both for or to deliver for the SRB meeting and then also for the October MSAB meeting, 
uh, I suggest that it would be uh, a simple one paper um, with key deliverables or, or items that the MSAB would need to provide guidance on for, for Alan and the team. Uh, and then, uh, as Alan has said, those uh, MSAB intercessional guidance or requests for action would be both passed to the SRB and then also the MSAB. And, and so it would really just be a, essentially a one or two page summary of an intercessional meeting. Uh, it would still be formal, but uh, it wouldn't have the same, let's call it padding, as we do with, with other um, subsidiary body meetings. It would just be a, a single paper that Alan would need very clear direction or guidance from uh, the MSAB on. And, and that could be relatively um, short and, and simple in, in its nature. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Could everyone hear Dave? Great. I'll take that as a yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I suspect we, we, we will need to dedicate a bit more time to this discussion about uh, what any subsequent meetings will look like. Uh, fr from the little bits that I've heard talking to folks, the concern mostly is that we don't want to be getting to October, the, the, the final meeting before presenting uh, very significant results to the Secretariat or to the Commissioners um, and have that as the, the one shot to, to provide that. So um, I suspect the conversations will be strongly influenced by what comes out of uh, this week's this week's papers. Um, okay, I see we're we're a little bit behind time, although I don't know if that's going to be time has lost all meeting over the past little while, so I don't know if that actually means anything at all. Uh, sorry, Alan, you had a question. Um, if we're going to move off the agenda, I just want to ask one more question um, about the process for this meeting is that the, the presentations, I doubt, are going to take three or four hours. It, you know, it depends on the discussion always, and I'm always um, pleased with how much discussion we have at MSAB meetings. But, um, you know, I'm wondering if right now the agenda is organized to have one paper each of the day. There's four papers, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Each paper is presented on each day. Um, and we might just want to consider if we want to jump ahead in the agenda or if we want to cut off each day and re maintain that four-day meeting, or if we want to actually see how quick we can get through this meeting and potentially shorten it. Um, I'll, I'll leave that up to everybody else, but I'm here for four days. Shorter is better. Uh, shorter is better. I've heard that from a few folks. Uh, I guess the one consideration, Alan, for yourself is if uh, we were really motoring through things, uh, are, are you ready on Tuesday morning to present Thursday afternoon material? Yeah, yeah. All, all of the presentations are actually posted online already, um, yeah. and unless there's specific requests from people, um, we're we're ready to go. Okay. I don't know. Uh, that uh, I don't know if there's anything for observe, <laughs> observers that um, were specifically looking on attending different days. I'm not as concerned about observers, more about m meeting attendees. Like, I don't know if folks here have said to your constituents, hey, you should really listen in on Wednesday because that's going to be really important for your specific interests. Yeah, and I'm happy to accommodate however is needed. Yeah. So is anyone in that situation where, where the delivery of a specific paper on a certain day is, is, is important? Okay, not hearing anything. Uh, I think we can probably plan to, to move through things a little bit faster. Um, I'll also say to folks, I, I, I will attempt to pause longer in between questions. Um, Usually it's good to leave a few seconds to let someone think. Uh, I find you also need to provide a few more seconds to allow people to find the unmute button in webinars. So it might be a, a longer awkward pause right now as we let people navigate the technology. Um, okay, Peggy, uh, Peggy, do you have a comment? Do you have a comment? Yeah, thanks. I, I feel like I'm raising my hand, so maybe I should just speak up. But thank you, Alan. That's what I wanted to say is, um, all of this, I think, is good. I would be in favor of taking this meeting as it comes and deciding whether we feel like we've gotten the information and we can move forward quicker than, than the agenda calls for. I do not have any of our members waiting for a Thursday or Wednesday 
to to check in at least they haven't notified me that that's what they want to do but um i think it's too early for me to say yeah i'm all for a quicker meeting because i missed october and i'm not sure how quickly i'm going to be able to catch up so uh, i'm i'm happy to do it and i'll let you know if i'm i need more time but um i can't really say that right yet okay. well, that's helpful peggy thank you okay so i think the takeaways from this is that we will uh um, move forward with the agenda as it is uh, as it was posted uh, in terms of the contents but we may move through through things a little bit faster uh, so if, sounds like folks are comfortable with that and i suggest we move on to the next agenda item which is 3.1 uh, msa membership um, now dr wilson was going to speak to a few points in paper 03 but before we do that um, I would really like a co-chair. <laughs> so uh, Carrie is very capable, uh, but officially her term expired yesterday. And so she has a slim opportunity of escaping now, but I'd like to um, open up the floor for discussion amongst uh, MSAB members, uh, particularly around seeking a nomination for uh, co-chair. I would point out Carrie is a very competent co-chair and I would be very selfishly very happy if she continued to be co-chair. Um, but yes, as, the, as per the rules of uh, procedure, there's um, defined terms for the co-chairs. And so if anyone's uh, interested in, in stepping up or putting forward um, a, a name, now is your opportunity. That's also why Carrie has been uh, quiet the past uh, past little bit i think right carrie i would nominate carrie if she's willing to, to continue on for one more term i would nominate her that she continue on as co-chair thank you very much dan you did a beat there i'll i'll uh, i'll second dan's nomination if carrie's willing thanks very much um all right, so there's a, a call for, for Carrie and a second as well for Carrie. Uh, any other nominations? Tom, okay. and, Tom Marking just noted in the chat his support for Carrie. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, and I forgot to mention, I think it's a two year term. Is that right, Dave? Yeah, that's correct. Perfect. Um, Okay, uh, then it sounds like uh, quite a bit of support for Carrie. Any any objections? No, I have no objections, but I do have a question. Carrie, are you willing to serve another two years, please? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I'm willing to, if people would like for me to. Thank you, Peggy. I was hoping to avoid that question. I didn't want to give too much choice, but <laughs> I think that's probably necessary and appropriate. Uh, Okay, well, uh, Carrie, thank you for uh, for not objecting. Uh, one last call for uh, anybody else for co-chair. I'm not hearing any. I think we can say that that appointment is is made and pass it along to. I, I guess Dave, do we pass it on to the commission or the secretariat to to formalize? Yeah. So all we do is we just pass that to the, to the uh, commissioners, uh, and they, they will, as for the other subsidiary bodies, uh, probably just note it um, in, into the record at the next at the interim meeting. Um, we Kerry has already provided a, a letter of uh, potential perceived conflicts of interest, and so we just pass that along with it as well. Um, Kerry, if there is any other um, addendum or, or modifications to that, just let me know. If not, I'm getting a, a head shake, so that's perfect. That's all we need. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. And most importantly, thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, I think the MSAB is very fortunate to have someone like yourself here helping us, um, helping us through uh, close to the end of a been a pretty long journey. So we've got some pretty big decisions to to make, and I really appreciate having you here. Uh, well, thank you, Adam, for guiding us through that process and uh, for. Um to all of you for uh, supporting me as co-chair, I suppose. Um, I'm happy to do this, uh, and I think it'll be exciting uh, in the next year to see where the 
MSAB goes uh, with regard to uh, recommendations and seeing these results of the spatial model. So it's an exciting time here. Okay. Okay, so with the appointment piece resolved, I think we can turn it over to Dave to identify any other um, membership pieces in paper 03. Yeah, thanks, um, Adam and, and Kerry. So this paper 03 was dated back the 10th of April of last year, uh, sorry, this year. Um, yes, time really has lost all meaning here, I have to say. Um, and since uh, the last MSAB, MSAB meeting, we've had three uh, specific changes to the membership. We have uh, Sarah Webster, who's been attending uh, most of the meetings uh, over the last couple of years anyway, uh, replaced uh, Jim uh, Hasbrook from ADFNG. We also, also had um, Maggie Summer, who's joined us as one of the Fisheries Management Council representatives from the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Uh, and she was appointed uh, last month. Um, and then also we have uh, Mr. Angus Grout, who is a new member uh, to the MSAB, uh, representing the Canadian commercial harvesters. Um, and so, so welcome Angus uh, in particular and, and Maggie, who I don't recall, Maggie, if you've actually attended any of the MSAB meetings uh, prior either. Um, but um, Chair, if, if we may, uh, maybe we could pass to those new members just to give a little bit of background about their interest in the MSAB and uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, great suggestion. Thanks very much. Um, I actually haven't heard from Angus, but uh, maybe uh, Maggie, would you mind going first and just giving the group uh, a brief introduction? <coughs> you know, turn on your webcam, say hi to everyone if you don't mind. Sure, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I um, would love to turn my webcam on, but still have not been able to get it working with GoToMeeting. So I will try to resolve that. Okay. But uh, here's an audio introduction in the interim. Um, I am with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm our Marine Fisheries Management uh, Program Leader. I represent ODFW on the Pacific Fishery Management Council. I have been attending uh, the IPHC interim and annual meetings uh, for about five years, but I have not yet attended a Management Strategy Advisory Board meeting, uh, although I have been uh, doing quite a bit of reading in the past several months to get up to speed on this with some of the background documents and the, the materials for this meeting. Thank you, Maggie. Yep. Thanks very much and welcome. Uh, yeah, Adam, you think that Angus is not on? Uh, I, I think he's on. I just didn't actually uh, hear him speak yet, but I I'm here. Speak. Hey, Angus, would you <laughs> mind uh, providing a, an introduction to the group? Yeah, hi, I'm Angus Grout, and yeah, thank you for having me on. Um, I've been a commercial halibut fisherman for the last 25 years. I've sat on the conference board for the last, uh, oh goodness, 10 or 12 years, as well as I'm an alternate for the halibut advisory board and the Pacific Halibut Management Association. And uh, I've followed the MSAB process with interest, although I confess <laughs> I've got a lot of catching up to do, so I'll probably be doing a lot more listening than talking, but uh, please bear with me while I try and catch up. Thanks very much, Angus, and welcome. I, uh, I particularly appreciate uh, folks like yourself who uh, don't go to meetings for their regular day job. Uh, it's a lot to ask the folks to come and participate in this session. So thank you for providing uh, your very valuable time. Thank you. All right. Um, anything else, Dave, to flag in the membership piece? Pretty clean. Thanks. Right. Well, if I may just note, Adam and Carrie, um, I, I believe Rachel Baker's online. She was nominated before MSAP 14, um, but was on, I don't think she was able to attend MSAP 14, um, but she's back, um, a longtime member that took a short um, pause and is now back with us. Yes, that's right. Her um, appointment came through, I think, partway through the October meeting. Uh, and actually, th there's a number of new faces that weren't around when Rachel was here. So maybe, Rachel, would, would you mind uh, giving a brief introduction as well? Yeah, also, Rachel's here in a new capacity, so. Yes, of course, right. Oh, there you go. Oh, muted. Oh, you're, this way, you're muted. Can help. I can help with that. I'll unmute her. 
Um, you there, Rachel? And Alan. There you go. What's that? You're good now. I just unmuted you, Rachel. Oh, okay. Um, yep, yeah, thank you. Nice to see everyone and hear everyone. Um, Rachel Baker with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, currently working primarily on um, federal state uh, management issues, much like Maggie's position uh, for the state of Alaska. And I did participate in the uh, Management Strategy Advisory Board for several years as a NOAA Fisheries employee. So familiar with this group and uh, look forward uh, to joining here at, at the end. I missed um, the most exciting part. You guys made a lot of progress while I was gone. And so maybe my leaving helped that progress. I don't know, but um, I'm back anyway. So nice to see everyone. Nice to see you, Rachel, again, too. And I disagree that we made progress in your uh, because of your absence. Uh, <laughs> maybe more exciting parts are still to come, too. Uh, but re really nice to have you back. OK, well, um, maybe we can wrap up the membership piece there and briefly go to uh, the next agenda item, which is uh, 3.2 updates from the October uh, session. And I, I don't know, actually, Alan, maybe we could even just wrap these all up 3.2 to um, to 3.4 in, in one go. I defer to you about what, what the best process is. They're all separate documents but I can just walk through them um, and just give the highlights and take any questions as we go. Yeah, okay. There's more just I'm not going to interject. I don't know, Carrie, unless there's anything else you want to flag on a specific paper. Yeah. Okay, so um, this will be then documents four, five, and six. Mm hmm All right. I'm sorry, I keep looking over here. I'm sort of monitoring what we're seeing on my laptop. Just make sure everything's going well. Um, so you're probably getting a lot of side profiles. Uh, so, okay, so as um, many of you uh, remember, you were at the MSAB 14, which is a, a really um, good productive meeting. And this document 04 just notes a few things. I'll just walk through a few of the, the deliverables um, and the recommendations that came out of MSAB 14. So um, uh, coastwide fishery objective is what was recommended, and that was this target reference point of a relative spawning biomass of 36%, at least 50% of the time. Um, as a reminder, this was an objective that was added to our long list of objectives. Um, that, of course, has been completed. Um, and I'll summarize what happened at the intersessional meeting uh, in, I think it was February of 2020. Um, with regard to the commission on that aspect. A whole table of goals and objectives uh, related to distributing the TCUI as well as coastwide goals and objectives was identified in the appendix of the report um, uh, from MSAB 14, um, and that was passed to the commission at the intersessional meeting in February, uh, which um, was subsequently approved, and I'll go over those details of that intersessional meeting. Um, shortly. We had um, noting the current progress on the coastwide um, MSE portion. The MSAB had recommended a couple of points being the SPR 43%, 30-20 control rule, and some type of constraint, as well as a range of management procedures in that noting that an SPR between about 40 and 46 percent would um, would likely meet the objectives that are defined. And these are on the coastwide level again, noting again that at the intersessional meeting um, that the commission took up in February, that uh, there was a recommendation coming out of that that um, acknowledged this recommendation from the MSAP. So again, we'll go over that intersessional meeting shortly. And please interject. Um, what I see on this big screen is just the document, which is why I keep turning, but if anybody has a comment, um, just please interject and interrupt. Uh, the next recommendation was related to uh, this year and the work plan that we're doing this year, and, and this is the management procedures for a coastwide scale, identifying a range um, of, proce of procedures. Yeah, Chuck has a question I just saw. 
Go ahead, Chuck. Go ahead. Yeah. I see you're unmuted, Chuck, but I'm not hearing anything. Very interesting. There, there you go, Chuck. Now I hear you. We did. Is there perhaps a mute on your computer? It shows the GoToMeeting showing that you're unmuted, Chuck, but perhaps there's a mute on your actual microphone. Uh, you're, you're coming. I see that it's indicating you can talk, Chuck. Can you give us a test? How about we come back? Chuck, keep trying. I'll move forward on this, um, and we can take a question on constraints at any time. Um, and it, it might relate more to the intersessional meeting anyway. So if you could try to debug. We're, it was working earlier, Chuck, so I'm not sure what's going on. I'll just leave you unmuted um, for now. <clears throat> so this recommendation was the range of SPR values for us to evaluate um, in, the, in, in 2020. And that is the range of SPR values along with some um, identification of various constraints, <clears throat> including a combination of constraints. For example, combining a slow up fast down with a 15% annual maximum so we're putting together that sort of design of management procedures. Uh, a, a, a long list of management procedures related to distributing the TCY supplied, and, and as a reminder, in the report from MSAP 14, there were two tables. One table was a longer table with basically a lot of ideas. The second table was a short list that we were to bring to this MSAB 15 meeting, um, and we will be working on it as quick as, as we can. Um, a request that the SRB make a comment on these paragraphs from their SRB 15 report. That is, of course, in progress, as we have not had an SRB meeting yet. Um, Chuck, I can hear some moving around, perhaps. Can Are you able to speak? I'm not sure I'm able. There. Yeah, I can hear. I can okay, hear. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll mute myself and wait. Um, okay, thanks. Um, a after I think we're almost done with this, and then we can take your questions. So again, this is in progress as the SRB will be meeting in June, and we'll make sure to bring this request to the SRB and, and um, gain further clarification on their comments. Uh, with that, I believe that's the. Oh no, there there is. Uh, so, uh, the MSAB wanted to record a number of elements that would be included in the distributing the TCY. This is actually something that's really useful to review, to remember what we talked about at um, MSAB 14, talking about coast-wide constraints, um, different harvest rates across the, the regulatory or biological regions, those are relative harvest rates. Um, the concept of distributing the TCY directly to a regulatory area from coastwide or going through regions to do that, uh, fixed shares concepts, and then this concept of a maximum fishing intensity so that there's some range of fishing intensities that are possible where you have a target fishing intensity that might be modified through a distribution procedure perhaps, but not to exceed some maximum fishing intensity. With that, that's the end of the update on actions from MSAB 14. Um, and if there are no questions, or as I'm bringing up the next document, feel free to interject with any questions. Chuck, do you want to try again? I'll try again if I'm coming through at all. Yeah, I, I, what I'm noting is that uh, we've, as far as the constraints, and, and it's bouncing all over the place, but MSAB 14 recommended one of the constraints being used, be it either uh, the plus minus 15 or 
and or slow up fast down but it and other documents are, are, are seem to be now just basically showing it as being a combined and I'm just wondering exactly where we're sitting on what we're going to be discussing because it doesn't matter it seems to matter or depend on which document you're looking at exactly how this that particular section uh, on which is uh, paragraph 46 uh, and I think on yeah anyhow exactly how it's actually supposed to be looking and they're different and I, I that'll be coming up later I'm sure but the, it's just when we're documenting and going back over this stuff over and over and it's changing it starts to get confusing as to what we actually agreed on that's yeah, thanks, Chuck. thanks. Um, it, thanks Chuck I, I'd like to bring the attention to paragraph 49 from the MSAP 14 report and, and that states here uh, the, these uh, SPR 30 per 20 control rule be evaluated along with constraints and it lists three three constraints and has this and or. And to, to be honest, Chuck, I, I, I sympathize that this is confusing. And part of the reason is I don't think that as, um, as the MSAB goes and as well as the secretary and the MSE team, we have not come up with a real specific constraint that we will be evaluating. Um, and part of that is some comments were made at the MSAB that it might be useful to evaluate these constraints in combination with, with, with each other. For example, the slow up, fast down approach might lend to um, a greater than 15% change in one year. Uh, but we could have a slow up, fast down approach and a 15% constraint on that. So I, I don't think the MSAB has actually come up with a, a specific way to, to evaluate the constraints or, or how they want them in the management procedure. So I think that's still open for discussion. And if we do want to have that discussion um, and have a more specific approach, that would be great. However, as we do, uh, as we do our simulations as the MSE team, we learn a lot as we're going along. And we, we may actually say, hey, we want to try this out and if it seems to work, we may present it to the to the MSAB as an additional um, procedure as well. Does that help? Yes, it helps verbalizing it in that manner. It's just in the documents, it almost looks like it is going to be including a 15% plus the slow up, fast down. That's the way you're looking at it, or the three-year uh, process. And it's that's where it starts to be questionable and this way we at least know that you're going to look at one or the other and maybe both but also in the metrics that, uh, that we'll be discussing later it doesn't show that it shows them combined in some of the the uh, the, uh, the comparisons and, and and rather than it's just going to be one or the other just didn't allow it and some are blank and that becomes leading when we start discussing that because the ones that show no constraints are likely almost going to be guaranteed not to work in comparison to the others. So we'll see how that discussion goes, but I know I appreciate the way you answered it just now. Okay, we, we can clarify that at this meeting then. Yeah, uh, thanks. I think that's a good point to, uh, to definitely come back to. Um, that's something we don't want to get too far down the line before we need to make a course correction, if any. Um, so on the speakers, I have Jim and then Peggy and then Dan. Jim, go ahead. Uh, that's okay. Um, the, uh, Alan and Chuck kind of got to most of it, so we're good. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Peggy? Oh, sorry, Peggy, one moment. You're muted. I got to find a faster way to unmute people here. That's me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. God, I was laughing at other people that were doing that. <laughs> So could you please go up to paragraph 34 um, in under the recommendations? I just have a question about this uh, deliverable from October, which I like. Um, but as I read this, the way that I understand that is that this would be a, a recommendation for a potential policy not to go um, below 
RSB 36% half of the time over a long term. So some vague, well, 50% is, is not vague, but long term is a little bit vague. And that's not the big thing I'm concerned about, though. The big thing I'm concerned about is that this is looking backward. So there's no, and, and I'm asking this question, is there any protective um, component of this management procedure that would, that would help steer a policy, um, a, a policy that would not, that we would not see ourselves going above, or sorry, below the 36% after we've already done it? Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not very, doesn't sound articulate. Yeah, uh, so uh, as a, um, and I, I realize you were not at the MSAP 14 meeting, so th th this was a big outcome of MSAP 14 in my mind. But this is an objective. Um, this isn't actually a procedure, but this would be an objective, and we would look at a procedure and its ability to meet this objective. So, for example, if we had a, a real high fishing intensity management procedure that brought the stock down to 10% relative spawning biomass 90% of the time, it would not meet this, this objective. Um, so, it, it, there, there isn't really a risk here what this objective is defining, that we have a target, that we, we want to be above 36% at least 50% of the time. And the long term has been defined in, by the MSAB, I believe, as 80 to 100 years or something like that. Far enough in the, in the, in the simulation such that it's come to an equilibrium, in other words. So this is an objective, and this is one of, of many objectives where a different objective is to not go uh, below an RSP of 20%, I think more than 5% of the time. So using those two in concert with each other says, I want to target this. I want to make sure I'm around or hanging around 36%, but I don't want risk of going below 20%. So th those two objectives are, um, they can work in concert with each other. Sometimes one will make the other uh, a moot objective, but I think they're both useful to have in this context. So I, let me bring up the harvest control rule. Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead, Adam. Or Alan? Yeah, no, sorry, Peggy. I was just going to ask if Alan could bring up the um, image of the harvest control rule. It might help explain the the uh, objective a little more too. While he's bringing that up, though, Peggy, please proceed. I guess my question is is altered from your response, Alan. Um, these objectives really aren't um, measurable until the time has passed. So that that's what I was sort of realizing here is that we could have these great objectives but we wouldn't know whether or not we've failed at meeting them until 80 or 100 years has gone by uh, that's an extreme example but the the thing i was hoping for is to is to be able to measure or create an objective that we can understand in a shorter time period whether it's working yeah uh Good point, um, Peggy. The the um, we're, the the point of the MSE is to simulate this. What might happen with the stock, with all the uncertainty that we we may see in the future, and variability, um, and and determine how likely a management procedure is to meet that objective. Um, so the the alternative to that is applying an actual management procedure and seeing in practice if it actually works. That's a, a dangerous experiment to do. And it has been done in many fisheries, but it's dangerous because you don't know if that objective is going to be met, but you're actually trying it out. Um, you might think of that as an adaptive management approach. But what we're doing with the MSE is we're avoiding what I like to sometimes call the live fire. And we're we can simulate anything. We can try anything out and, and see if it works or not in theory, and then put it into practice, sort of vetting it before we actually put it into practice. When we came up with this objective, we used all of the past data and did a, a, a lengthy analysis of surplus production um, and productivity to determine what are likely maximum sustainable yield and maximum economic yields that 
that we should be then defining the target based on. So a lot of work has gone in, into this 36%, identifying it as, given what we've seen in the past, over the past 100 years of fishing this halibut stock, um, what is likely a good target? So we have sort of that hindsight to guide us and the data to guide us. And now we're going to put together these management procedures and say, with all the variability that's possible in the future, will we meet this objective or will we not meet this objective? And then yeah, as we, thank you. It, yeah, and as we get into practice, um, we'll be monitoring it. And that's part of having these annual meetings to make sure that we're not just setting something, you know, set it and forget it. We don't want to forget it. We want to set it and make sure that every year we um, are looking at it and seeing if there's anything new that could be causing a departure from what our expectations were. Yeah, thanks, um, Alan. I appreciate that. Okay, so, and, and uh, I put up this harvest control yeah. rule. This, you know. Yeah, I, I was well. I think that the question kind of went a different direction, but maybe it wouldn't hurt to reiterate. So there was kind of two components of that conversation. One was um, uh, whether there's some sort of like retrospective ability to figure out if we've missed our objective or our target. And the response from Alan is that the, the reason one does closed loop simulation and does MSE is that you're you're simulating your your fishery practice before you uh, before you actually implement it. So it's a you know, it's like you're in a flight simulator before you actually get into a real plane and, and crash it or not. Um, so that's that's where MSEs in particular are quite helpful, that you're not doing this live fire exercise. Um, the, the second piece about the specific recommendation from the October meeting around the target um, might be helpful just to reiterate to folks what the target was, why the target was advanced. So I, my recollection from uh, the, the commissioners and some folks at this table was that a target was desired uh, to stop us from kind of living right on the edge of the trigger or threshold. In the absence of a target, some were concerned that the stock uh, would always be trying to meet just the, the lowest common denominator of staying just above the, the threshold where the slope begins. And that can be an uncomfortable place to live in resource management because it adds quite a bit of variability as you come off of the ramp and go back onto the ramp. If you have a target it, it, um, and you define a management procedure that tries to keep you around that target, you'll see that you're staying away from the ramp more often than not. So a target has the benefit of um, reducing some of the variability. Uh, this target in particular has a benefit of reducing some of the variability that you'll see from a, a successful procedure. Uh, components or things that folks would consider in defining a target are things like uh, maximum sustainable yield or maximum economic yield. And those were some of the pieces that uh, the group had talked about in October that led to the definition of the um, SB 30 or RSB 36%. Am I correct also that uh, the target was designed as a fishery objective rather than a biological objective? So that's yes. a, a a nice thing to sort of keep in the back of your mind when you're trying to understand what that is. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point, Carrie. Um, okay, uh, Dan, you had a question. Uh, no, I guess with a follow up on what Chuck was saying, um, that my recollection of what we did at MSAB 14 was to ask for the combined analysis of slow up, fast down. At MSAB 14, we had a separate analysis that showed slow up, fast down had lower year-to-year -year variability, but you could still take the big drop. And the MAX 15 had higher year-to-year, -year, but it prevented you from taking big drops. And we were looking at some of the results of that, and that's why we asked for a combined one to be looked at. Um, and I think it's fine to revisit that as part of our discussion on what management procedures we want to have move forward. But if we do, it'd be nice if um, Alan could be ready to just show us those summary tables he showed us back in October that led us to that initial recommendation. Um, just trying to give Alan a heads up on what might be helpful for that discussion. And then the other thought I had was that, you know, we, in October, we explicitly talked about this being a coastwide constraint and that we weren't really identifying things on a, on a distribution area level for a constraint um, yet because we needed to see what the actual volatility was, what was causing that volatility before we could design our constraint for that. So I think the context of both of those are still at the coastwide scale. And I think we still have a 
have a thumbtack in, do we need to have something you know, beyond the coast-wide constraint at an each area level because to handle volatility there? I'm not sure we can actually have that discussion until we see the results. That's all, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'll uh, get those uh, summary tables together tonight. They're, I, I believe they're in a presentation from MSAP 14. Um, unless people really want to see them today, I can dig them up during a break, but um, I might be able to get my head around it a little bit more if I do that tonight. Yeah, I think let's wait till tomorrow. Uh, I, th I think that the two important takeaways is understanding the different constraints that are either additive or, or you know, each acting on their own in different procedures. Uh, and then also flagging the point that Dan made about the management procedures. This recommendation was specifically around coastwide scale. Uh, we did have some discussion, fair bit of discussion, acknowledging that um, a lot of the scale piece is likely to change once we get into distribution as well. That, or at least we need to revisit some of the scale pieces when we uh, when we get through distribution. Okay. Uh, any other questions for um, for paper zero four? I, can I, Adam? I'll just make one more comment about that. That I think we ended up with a combined uh, constraint when we were really trying hard to narrow down the number of management procedures, and so we had some in there in our longer list. If we look back, I think that had either one or the other coastwide constraint. And I think we decided that uh, on this particular point in understanding what uh, slope fast down did relative to um, a max 15% change, um, those general concepts weren't gonna change uh, if applying them coastwide in a spatial analysis. Um, and so we decided we didn't need to have um, we've already done uh, slope fast down on its own. We've already done the 15% max constraint on its own, but we haven't done the combined. Uh, and I think that's how we ended up with that in our list of final management procedures, uh, but not doing one at a time. Uh, right. right. There are other aspects. Yeah, that's my recollection as well. Coastwide uh, results from the coastwide analysis that we felt might change more once we move to a spatial model. Uh, and so uh, those are still being experimented with, such as uh, what are the appropriate uh, SPR rates to use, et cetera. Right, right. So Adam, it's Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. So uh, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on what uh, we're saying here going forward. I mean, my understanding and the way the documents read it, it and I, I thought Dan sort of summarized it, it, it can be one or the other or both combined. And we that was sort of going to be up for discussion until we saw some results. Is that what we're saying here? In terms of a final recommendation, yes. I think the, conver the clarification that Carrie pointed out was that uh, for this it was, it's, was it for this specific recommendation or just for the specific procedures that Alan or Secretary was going to work on over the next six months would focus on this? Yeah, it was just, I'm sorry, it's not for the recommendation in particular. I think it was just for uh, the, the final list of management procedures that we came up with, um, focusing on, the, on combining those two constraints, uh, the priority, because uh, we have not tried that before, to us why. Uh, okay, so I, sorry, uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Adam. Okay. I, I just, I, I missed the last bit of last MSAB, so I apologize for that. But just to feel like when you look at Appendix 6, it gives the proposed and recommended management procedures. Some include both of the constraints, some include one of the constraints, um, some include no constraints. So um, just want to be clear on sort of what's moving forward. Yeah, so my recollection is that we weren't excluding any of those specific procedures, but um, the the list of 17 needed to be prioritized into a, a more manageable chunk that the Secretariat could work on. And so the uh, procedures that combined plus minus 15% in the slope fast down were prioritized for evaluation in this sub list, the list of 10 rather than the list of 17. They were prioritized because we have not yet seen much by way of performance for a, a combined and additive constraint. Uh, we have seen some performance for just slow fast down, just 
plus minus 15 percent. Uh, Chris, if I can clarify, it's better. Uh, in Appendix 6, so you have two tables. Uh, so Table 1 is uh, uh, the full list of the management procedure proposed. And then you have Table 2, which is uh, uh, a short list of those 17. So if you look at Table 2, you have the recommended management procedure for evaluation at MSAB 50, and that's the, the 10 that Kerry was mentioning. So in there, you will only see that there is the combined constraint that is the slow up pass down plus the max change 15 percent yeah i know i think that clarifies it so thank you okay um anything else on document four with the outcomes of msat 14. Yeah, this is Chuck. I had had put my Hi, uh, list on the on the chat line for speakers since you can't see my picture. Um, I, I guess just this past uh, discussion, Carrie used the word that uh, that that this is a final list, and uh, I believe the understanding was that this was prioritized because of the immense time it takes to even do the, the nine or ten, and that the the remainder ones would be done later but this was the first first wave of them that we were going to be putting through that they were not going to be the final list because there are others in there that needs to be need to be looked at as well um chuck um thank you for that clarification i meant the final list ending ending as of the last meeting for alan to analyze between uh between meetings so not the final list for the commissioners um uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I Thanks. think that does put uh, that's a clarification that actually I, I'd like to see. Is, so when do we go from uh, table two back to table one, or or some new version? Like, wh when is table two going to be revised? Or I don't know if we're going to be able to do it at this meeting without much by way of results. Um, jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, something I think we do need to be able to come back to because I know at least myself at the annual meeting had a number of questions from a conference board in particular about, uh, well, my favorite management procedure in table one or none of the tables wasn't on table two. How do I get mine on table two and when do I get to put it on there? So I, I think that's for a subsequent agenda item when we talk about the procedures, but I do want to flag here that is something that just, I know I've been asked and I presume others were as well. Yeah, Adam, I was um, planning to have that discussion during the program of work um, agenda item. During the program of work agenda item, we'll be talking about sort of looking forward through 2020, the year 2020. Yeah, that sounds good. And, and you mean the, the Thursday program of work, not the one that's scheduled for 20 minutes right, from now? Right. right. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, looking at time, I I think maybe it's probably useful to move on to paper five. Okay, thanks. And I don't see anybody unmuted on the, or on the chat. So this is just, again, the outcomes of the SRB 15, which has remained unchanged or, or well, the, the, the SRB has not met since MSAT 14, so there's no new report to report on. Um, and this document is just identifying some of those um, recommendations and notes that are applicable to the to the MSE from that SRB meeting. Um, with that, I'm not going to say much more about it. Um, there are some recommendations um, which we're you know we're we're taking in, and we'll report back to the SRB on these. Uh, I will open up the next document and uh, while I wait to see if anybody has any comments on the SRB recommendation or report. For the SRB, Ellen, uh, was there any feedback from the, sorry, I should look this up myself. I think from the annual meeting, was there anything from SRB members that we should maybe anticipate them putting forward? Yeah. I, I think one 
One thing that Dr. Cox was talking about at the annual meeting was Yeah, this, this paragraph 51 here, listed here, in that the commission developed a standard criterion for achieving a limited set um, for overarching objectives to help really winnow down the management procedures quite quickly, to identify which ones aren't working and then which smaller set we should focus on. And at the annual meeting, I presented our, um, the plan for doing the evaluation which was we have these um, conservation objectives, which are um, have are very are measurable objectives with um, tolerances assigned to them, and that's going to narrow down the set of management procedures quite quickly. And what the MSAB is going to be tasked with is really evaluating the trade-offs between those various fishery objectives. So I see the SRB you know, potentially talking about this um, w with us in in sort of our, our plan for doing the evaluation and how we're going to actually do the evaluation. Um, and you can review the annual meeting document for how I, I thought that we would. And I believe at MSAP 14 we had that discussion defining tolerances or not defining tolerance in the objectives to specifically evaluate trade-offs or leave them as a real more um, strict performance measure that as the management procedure makes it or doesn't make it. And I right. note also that the SRB uh, membership, uh, there'll be a, a, at least one new face on the SRB coming up in um, June. And that's yeah, going to be an online meeting day yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, and th that'll be an online meeting as well. <clears throat> Yeah, that point about uh, standard criterion for achieving a set of objectives is a good one. Uh, I think it's something that would be helpful for us to keep in mind, particularly as we get to the evaluation piece, about really focusing on our key set of objectives um, and then does it achieve it or not, as opposed to really uh, focusing on the whole plethora of performance metrics. Just we have our objectives, did this procedure meet the objective uh, and use that as a first cut so that we're not going down a rabbit hole of um, tweaking different performance metrics. Um, okay. So, yeah, so uh, I'll open up the next document unless, uh, and wait for any questions while I'm doing that. Jump in there real quick on, respond to Adam. I mean, I think, that's a rabbit hole that we continually try to avoid going down. And the two sides of that discussion are, do we reopen our whole objectives and try and find some with tolerances that really get at the scope of considerations people have, or do we keep it to just a few of our primary objectives and then have a lot of performance statistics that people can look at and see the whole picture? And I just think there's two ways that people go about this. One is I'll know it when I see it. It'll give me a couple of different indicators that I can look at and evaluate trade-offs. And the other is, no, we're just going to try and distill everything down to two trade-offs. We'll put a tolerance on it, and it's a win or lose thing. And I think we've had these discussions at a lot of meetings, and what we've got is kind of the compromise we reached, which is we have some conservation objectives with tight tolerances on them. We've got some management objectives on around variability and yield, which are, you know, prioritized. And then we've got some statistics that help people understand how you know, the variety of different considerations go into some of those objectives and um, you know we can try and reopen the whole objectives thing again but every meeting we end up kind of going down that rabbit hole and we don't get much farther than we've actually gotten so far yeah. those are my thoughts on it I'm kind of happy with the suite we've got mm -hmm. yeah I, I'd agree with that that we're and uh, that I don't think we need to add a whole bunch more right now let's make some progress with what we've got yeah, I would agree with Dan also. Um, I, I, I think we've come to a really good place with our objectives and our evaluation, and you may have noticed that I do not have objectives anywhere on the agenda for this meeting. But um, if there are no more comments on the SRB document, I will discuss the outcomes of the annual meeting and the inner the sixth special session of the commission. 
um, which does have a little bit on objectives. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, please proceed. <clears throat> okay, so the, uh, you, you may have remembered at the annual meeting, the report from the annual meeting was a, a lot of the commission recalled what the MSAB and the um, Secretariat have been do, doing with regard to the MSE. Um, with a note that they would take up some more specific decision making um, part of the MSE or those recommendations from the MSAP during a special session in February. And that is exactly what happened. So the, the report has a lot of noted, agreed uh, regarding the MSAP recommendations. The commission didn't really disagree or didn't, in, in my interpretation, really um, change any of the recommendations coming from the MSAB. They felt things were moving forward. The special session, which I'm just scrolling down to now, came up with, let me just verify that, yes. So the special session was a very fruitful discussion with the commissioners regarding the MSE. Um, and we, we spent an hour or two, I would say, having this discussion with the commission. And they had uh, basically two statements that came out of that special session. The first is that the commission recommended the primary coastwide and area specific objectives outlined in table one of this document as well. Um, and this document is online as uh, um, CR is, uh, I blanked on what it stands for. Circular. So circular, right. <laughs> I was thinking continuing resolution for some reason. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was released in a circular with, with all of these statements as well as some other statements as well. Um, but related to the MSE is they, they recommended the objectives as were stated in the MSAP 14 report. So that was good. And we had a quite a lengthy discussion about those objectives um, and the commission thought they were good. I'll just note um, that they put in the statement be used for evaluating MS3E results conditional on future considera consideration of the objectives after the preliminary MSE results are presented at MSAP 15. What this statement says to me is exactly what the MSE process is, is that this is an iterative process. We learn from, from every step in this process. We've defined objectives. We're We've defined management procedures. We need to see results. Once we see those results, we're going to go back and make sure that our objectives and our management procedures are um, what we do want to work with in this process. So I felt that was really good, and they're embracing that iterative process as well. Let me just show you briefly the table of objectives to remind everybody. This table is also exactly as shown here in our MSAP 14 report. Um, and this is all that I was planning to talk about objectives, was uh, we have conservation objectives, keeping the female uh, spawning biomass above a limit, and that limit was 20% of unfished. And then also we, we preliminarily defined some limits on the distribution side of things, and this is where we really have to revisit as we start getting results. This is the objective, conservation objective of maintaining, or actually a fishery objective, maintaining a spawning biomass around a level that optimizes fishing activities. This is that 36% with a tolerance defined. So these are the objectives that have tolerances that would really be used to identify whether a management procedure meets these objectives or does not meet these objectives. If it does not meet these objectives, it does not go through to further evaluation. The other two broad categories of objectives or general objectives are limiting catch variability and providing directed fishery yield. There's a number of different sort of uh, measurable objectives in there that are specific to coastwide or regulatory areas and different concepts. Um, and those are, <clears throat> again, without tolerances and more that we'll be looking at to evaluate the trade-offs between. So that, that's a reminder of the objectives. That's all that I was planning to talk about those objectives until we start seeing more results and can revisit um, and see if, if those objectives are satisfactory in our process. The second um, statement made by the commissioners at this special session relates to the um, specific recommendation that the MSAB made and the results of the Coastwide MSE. Um, I was very happy to see this. 
the commission make this recommendation of basically a reference SPR fishing intensity of 43% with a 30-20 control rule be used as an updated interim harvest policy, um, noting that there are additional components uh, uh, tended to apply for a period 2020 to 22, as defined in the report from the last annual meeting. More specifically, those are the allocations to 2A and 2B, um, and accounting for some impacts of the U26 non-directed discard mortality. So this is great. The commission is now making a recommendation that is based on the MSE results. So everybody in the MSAB should be patting themselves on the back for a job well done. We've done a lot of work, and now that's actually transpired into um, policy and guidance. So when Ian does present the assessment um, at the annual meeting in 2020, and also the interim meeting in 2019, or we are in 2020, the interim meeting in 2020, the annual meeting in 2021, he will be using this 43% as an interim management procedure in his um, mortality table and in the decision table as well. Um, so that's the outcomes of the special session, and I can take any questions if anybody has any. While you're doing, well, while everybody's thinking about that, um, and maybe it's just nobody wants to open up objectives again. Hey, Alan, did you participate in, you presented at that special session, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, so. Was there any, any takeaways from the commissioner's thoughts on, on the process or what their interest was? I mean, my <clears throat> recollection is, is this uh, special session was set in part because there was just too much else going on at the annual meeting and they didn't feel like there was enough time dedicated to MSE at the AM, so they wanted to have a block of time. Um, I thought that was good that the commissioners were, were, were interested and engaged in the MSE work. Was there anything else that came from it, or was it mostly just going through the checklist to make sure you get all their deliverables done? Um, it, it was actually a, a, a very good discussion. Uh, they, um, they they had a lot of questions about the objectives, about what the target objective meant, the 36%. And it, it, it made me realize why they made the decision at the annual meeting to delay this a little bit is they just wanted to hear more and have a, a more discussion about what the MSAB has been doing and what the Secretariat has been doing and, and why these recommendations are really coming out. Um, and so given that, uh, I think the only concern was is, and, and they stated it in their uh, statement, you know, these conditional on future consideration of the objectives is they just wanted to make sure these are not the objectives being set in stone, that this iterative process continues okay. um, and that we're learning from those. Okay, well, that's helpful, thanks. I think that that's good news. Uh, I ask in part because I recall some of the conversations we've had in, in Sitka and also prior to that about, um, I think, uh, a bit of a struggle that the MSAB has had in finding ways to effectively engage commissioners. We've said a number of times how important it is, how important we feel it is to have commissioners really involved in this session so that um, they have a good, deep understanding of the of the recommendations that come forward. Uh, I think this um, special session helped meet some of those needs. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And, keep thinking on other ways that we can have the commissioners really engaged as we come up to um, delivery of some long anticipated results. Yeah, um, I, I agree. And, and as a reminder, um, we were hoping to have some commissioner or inviting the commissioners to the October meeting for um, more specific evaluation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I anticipate um, uh, commissioners asking for maybe more in-depth updates as we get closer to get at some of their you know, work meetings or uh, subsequent meetings of this group. Right. If there are no more questions on the um, annual meeting or the special session, I can just, um, what I wanted to do was just a real quick reminder of our work plan for 2020. 
um, and then take a short break and then get into the presentation on the management procedures. Yeah, I think that sounds good uh, for, for folks uh, around the room. The idea of this agenda item was an acknowledgement that obviously this meeting is a little bit different than what we had envisioned it was going to be like uh, a number of months ago or even at the annual meeting. So uh, while we do have a chunk of time dedicated to talk about the program of work later in the session, this is just a, a brief refresher of um, where we where we hope to be and we can use this information uh, we can let this information kind of percolate in in the background as we go through some of the results from this meeting to help us provide some advice on Thursday or whenever we get to the program of work piece to uh, to revise our, our recommendations. We'd also talked about considering what this group looks like post 2021. Uh, there was a very brief conversation at the annual meeting about that. That's true, and if, if I may backtrack for one, one second. The, um, I guess another outcome of the annual meeting was um, consideration of where the MSE may continue after, 20, after the annual meeting in 2021. And for example, this 83, um, the commission did note the MSE is an appropriate tool for other analyses. Um, so, um, I don't want to jump ahead too much uh, because we do have a lot to focus on in 2020 and getting these distribution results to the annual meeting or AMO 97. But um, it was um, encouraging to me to see the commission thinking ahead and, and realizing that the tools that we're building now are not these one-off tools that we're going to do this analysis with, that these tools, we're, we're actually building tools that will be used for a long period of time to do many different analyses. And I think what we'll be doing is filling in all those gaps and in all those documents Ian and I have been writing where we're doing these quick analyses. And at the end, we usually say the MSE is probably the more appropriate um, method to do this type of analysis or a different, a, another way to look at it. So we'll be able to do those after we um, build these tools. Uh, may I move on? Yes, All right, so just a, a brief overview. This is 2020 leading up to the annual meeting in 2021, which is AMO 97. And uh, so here we are at MSAB 15, um, reviewing goals and objectives, which we had on our work plan, which uh, we're not really doing in, in this. Um, and uh, as we've noted, it's probably best to cut that off for now and continue working with what we have. We'll bring that up in um, subsequent analyses or evaluations. Uh, we're going to review the simulation framework here. We're going to review what uh, some of the multi-area model, although we have not presented any results of the multi-area model at this point in time. And then the reviewing the preliminary results that is not going to be able to be done at MSAT 15. Um, but again, you know, identifying the management procedures is a real big outcome of this, guiding us forward. I realize hard to do without seeing preliminary results, but we'll do what we can, and we've already had some good discussions about the constraints. <clears throat> In the June SRB meeting, they'll take a more technical um, look at the framework and the multi-area model. And so we'll have some results of the actual modeling and how the multi-area model is able to mimic the population dynamics of Pacific halibut. And then they'll be able to review any preliminary results of the MSE at that point in time, provide guidance to us that we'll then bring back um, to the SRB in September and reviewing penultimate results of the MSE of this first round of the MSE. And by penultimate there, I mean they may have some insight into how we can further the um, enhance the results that we presented, additional management procedures, a different way to incorporate the simulations or the framework, for example. And we'll do our best to incorporate any of those recommendations before the October MSAB meeting. Um, and that will be, that October MSAB meeting is going to be a very important meeting of reviewing results and providing those recommendations for the MPs, 
on scale and distribution, where scale is the coast-wide level distribution or to the regulatory areas, uh, and provide those recommendations to bring to the annual meeting in 2021. <clears throat> so we've already been through that process in, in a, a sort of a, an exercise, you might say, with the coast-wide MSE. Uh, that is exactly what happened last year. We, uh, the MSAP provided some very useful recommendations that were brought to the, to the commission. And now we're doing that again on this one-year timeline, um, which is why the MSE team is working extremely hard to get this, get this done and to make sure that everything is accurate um, and representative of what we, we need it to be representative of. <clears throat> we'll revisit this program of work on Thursday or at the end of the, near the end of the meeting and be able to um, modify this as we move forward. But for now, just keep this in mind. Um, we've already had a discussion about p potentially squeezing in some special session in August um, before the SRB meeting to see where the results are at at that time. All right, thanks, Alan. Uh, any uh, brief comments or points of clarification on the schedule that you see on the screen now? As people are coming up, I'll just show the agenda real quick again. So yeah, we're, we're, we're just coming up to a break. Um, and we're exactly on time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what I would uh, suggest is if there aren't any questions now, that we, we take our break, um, but that we'll, we will come back um, and do uh, one of those more um, deliberate around the room points for everyone. So folks can collect their thoughts over the break and then we'll, we'll have a chance for everyone to, uh, to, to speak up. Um, even if you don't have much to add, you can just say no, nothing to add for the moment. But I think it would be good to dedicate some time. Sorry, Carrie. Should we just do a brief summary of the morning before we take a break? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, so if, if that works for people, then let's, let's do a brief summary. Uh, I've yeah. got a couple of points here, Carrie. Do you have something as well? Uh, yeah, I, I wrote down some notes. Um, but I'm happy for, we can do it either way. Okay, uh, okay, okay well, uh, why don't you mind, would you mind going and I can scribble on my notes as well? Okay. Uh, that's great. So uh, we started out the morning uh, introducing some new MSAB members and uh, and also re-upping my um, co-chair role for another two years. So we introduced Maggie Smith from ODF and W and uh, also Angus. I don't remember Angus's last name right now. Mr. Grout. Thank you. Uh, um, who's a commercial halibut fisherman in Canada. Um, we went through, and also Rachel Baker, who is rejoining us. Um, we went through uh, update on actions from the last MSAB, and in that we reminded ourselves why we have management procedures that have uh, sort of two constraints piled on top of each other at once, and why we prioritize that. Um, the discussion that we had at the last meeting about whether we will need to apply constraints um, spatially. We reviewed the objective to have a, a target, um, uh, a target, uh, which is a fishery objective, and its basis, which which it's based on uh, MSY and EY, which we spent quite a bit of time on at some previous meetings. Uh, and so, trying to stay kind of away from the ramp for stability, but also um, trying to maximize yield or maximize economic yield. Uh, one of those two things. So that's based on some analysis that Alan did. We reviewed the SRB document and really just focused on um, uh, pointing out that the SRB was uh, pushing us towards having kind of a, a set set of objectives uh, that we don't need to revisit during every meeting. And then we uh, reviewed the IPHC intersessional meeting notes um, uh, where uh, we found that they felt like things were moving forward and they didn't change any recommendations and during their special sec session, which is described in uh, circular 007 for people who are interested. 
um, the commissioners reviewed the objectives and they uh, kind of were on board with them, but noted that this process should still be iterative. There should be some opportunity at some point in the future to revisit those if needed. Uh, and also uh, kind of uh, put their stamp on um, uh, the idea of an, an interim management procedure with a 43% SPR with a 30-20 control rule uh, with some other specific uh, directives mixed, mixed in with that that were applied this past year. Uh, and then we went over the program of work and revisited the idea that we uh, may need to have some sort of summer meeting and that's something that we'll talk about in more detail later on in this meeting uh, once we've gotten through a few more of the materials. So that's what I have. Uh, Adam, do you have more to add to that? Not, uh, not a whole lot more. Uh, maybe just to note that the uh, agenda for this session will be compressed as needed. We're, we're not going to be bound by the times per se. If we're moving along faster, we, uh, we may end up uh, concluding this meeting a little bit faster. Um, we, we did have a bit of discussion around what the key deliverables are for MSAB 15. Uh, I would say let, let's first refer to the papers which have a set of uh, recommendations or next steps in them, but if we were to put it in one word, I'd say the key deliverable for this meeting is refining manager procedures for the MSC team's evaluation. Uh, and this is probably going to necessitate the subsequent meeting. Um, now, we did hear from Alan, he would say August, not earlier than August. Um, and I think David said there'd be less uh, padding was the word, uh, maybe less uh, uh, formality around this uh, intersessional MSAB meeting is needed. Um, so we, we're going to need to dedicate uh, more time to that discussion about figuring out what our immediate next steps are. But first, let's see um, uh, the presentations from the Secretariat before we get to, to that step. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Carrie. Uh, um, I've got one more comment. Um, Maggie's last name is Summer, not Smith. I'm mixing and matching my Maggie's. So welcome to Maggie Summer. Sorry, I missed that too. Um, okay, uh, so let's let's take the break now. Uh, come back at um, five after eleven. We'll give ourselves a, a ten minute break, and uh, just before we get into agenda, agenda item four point one. We'll, uh, we'll go around the room for MSAB members uh, and see if they have any specific um, things that they want to raise with respect to the plan for MSAB 15 over the next couple of days. Uh, when we're on break, uh, I'll turn my screen off. Alan, I don't know if, you, if the, it'll just be a shared screen, I guess, then. Um, I'll, I'll keep the agenda up and the webcam on in the boardroom. Um, and whenever you're ready to bring the meeting back to order, just um, okay. go ahead. Great. Okay. Um, well, uh, we'll get going. And, and if I just make one quick note, okay. as you're on break, think about if there's anything that's not working or is working for uh, the online portion of this meeting. It, it seems to be going really well on my end. Um, but if you have any suggestions for improvement, um, let us know. We'll try to adapt during the meeting. But also, feel free to write any comments to the Secretariat here at IPHC. This is our first meeting this year in this format. We'll probably be having other meetings in this format. So we're, um, we're really looking forward to hear people's comments of what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, yeah that's a good prompt, Alan. So maybe the, the two questions uh, to consider over the break and we'll come back to folks with is uh, any feedback on this current meeting format so that it can form subsequent uh, secretary or commission meetings. And um, something more specific for us is what, um, what what do you feel you need to see out of this meeting to, to make it a constructive use of your time? Okay, folks, uh, we'll talk in 10 minutes. Thanks, Adam. For both of you. Um, so I think we can get the meeting started again. Uh, hopefully we've got uh, everyone back. We need to have back. And uh, let's see, um, I'm gonna open the list of attendees and what we were gonna do first before we move on to other items is uh, go through person by person 
and um, we've got a couple of questions. One is, uh, do you have any comments on the program of work and um, the morning in general that you'd like to make? And the second question um, was regarding whether you have any ideas about um, improvements for uh, the form of the meeting. I believe, and how everything is working online for you. So I'm just going to go down the list of participants here, and this is where it's useful if you um, put in your, um, I think we're going to ask MSAB members, is that right, Adam? Uh, yeah, so it'll be useful if you put in your whole name rather than just some initials, because that helps me know who you are. Um, the first person I see on here is Angel. Uh, Angel, do you have, uh, feel free to turn your webcam on and make any comments that you'd like to make? Um, no comment at this time. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, the next person I see is Angus. Yeah, no comment for me, just the format seems to be working well. Okay. Uh, Chris? Score. Uh, yeah, can you hear me now, Carrie? Sorry, I was muting and unmuting. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't have the webcam turned on. There's a, um, I think it's a dance class going on by Zoom in the other room, and uh, we're. <laughs> I've had in past experience like calls like this. The bandwidth doesn't always cooperate, so I don't think. Hopefully tomorrow I'll be uh, using the webcam. So anyway, just some comments on the program of work or the morning session. One thing I think uh, I, I was thinking about during the break is I think that as we're talking and we're trying to decide on management procedures going forward, and we had some of the discussions about constraints and that, I just think if we if we could all think a little bit on a framework of so that we if we come back in August with some results, we're going to have to turn that around fairly quickly. If we could think about, you know, okay, we're going to pick 10 of them, and, and maybe that's already been done. I wasn't at the last meeting, but, you know, like, okay, uh, management procedure A can compare to C and, and B can compare to F and just so that when we're looking at them if there's certain things people want to see like how different constraints react we've got a way to do that uh, coming up in August that's that's my only thought there on, on the morning session because it's I think we are going to be challenged for time here um, and uh, that's just one thing that came to mind in terms of the impact on the format of the meeting um, uh, you know, we're, this is all new to all of us, and we're all trying uh, how to make this work so far. I think it's working fairly well, um, and I think, uh, you know, if we continue to get suggestions from people, that'll be a good idea, because I think we're going to have more of this in the future than less. So that's all I have to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's see. I see Chuck next. Okay, I think I'm on. Uh, yep. Yeah, I guess I just adding to what Chris had said to say, I think number one, in thinking about how October meeting went, and I know Chris was very, very sick, and and we got very we got rushed at the end on putting together these management procedures. And had we given them more thought at the time as how the constraints are going to be used or looked at for this initial process i know on one of them uh i think it's j we would have added a constraint so it just is annoying now that how we're trying to compare apples and apples but yet you're comparing apples and oranges and how this is all going to look uh at going forward if the others aren't going to be uh, looked at either separately and additionally i just that'll be part of the discussion i think that we come up and start discussing these is um yeah thank you for bringing that up so some concerns about our um our quote final our whether we did not current do that list our current list one of those going to be um i'm sorry can you just say that again The, um, uh, maybe like the the last two sentences you said I missed, uh, Chuck. I'm not sure exactly what. I mean, I, basically, it was just 
I just think on hindsight that we rushed, we we're so busy trying to put together the list that we missed some of the aspects that how it's going to actually play out. And now we're realizing how they, some of these are gonna play out. And when you're trying to compare against the other ones that have constraints, uh, you're not talking apples and apples, you're talking apples, oranges. And I don't know how science is gonna look at that when they're not, we really don't know, won't know the whole picture at this particular point in time. Uh, so I think what you're saying is perhaps uh, an opportunity at some point during this meeting to revisit the management procedures that are currently on the table for analysis. And I think that is, will be part of our discussion later on. Yes. Alan, correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Okay. Sounds right, yeah. And, and we'll have that opportunity during our program of work agenda item. Great. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I see Dan. Dan Falvey. Yeah. There. Yeah, I think my comments are similar to Chuck and Chris's, is that um, maybe we could give some thought in before Thursday into how to structure that talk about the management procedure moving forward table, but we understand, you know, what's a final suite, you know, final package look like, or to what extent we can still have concepts in that table, and then we'll be able to come back once we see how those concepts work and repackage them into a final cohesive two or three alternatives. And I think one of the I think when we put this table together, it was to explore these concepts and see the results here at the May meeting that we might then adjust and repackage a little bit <clears throat> to get a second look at in October. We're not gonna have that opportunity, it seems like, or it'll be a more limited opportunity between August and October. So how can we be most productive at this meeting in terms of um, packaging alternatives that you know we wanna make sure we have all the pieces together in one cohesive management procedure that has different elements. And you'll have to answer that now. It's just something to think about how to structure Thursday's discussion to make that happen. Okay, great. Yes, so how can we be most efficient in our list of management procedures, uh, given that we will probably have a chance to review that in uh, uh, late, late summer, perhaps. It's a uh, good comment. Thank you, Dan. I, I see Forrest. Yeah, I don't have anything to add right now. Thanks, Terry. Mm -hmm. um, Glenn? Um, Glenn may have stepped away. Glenn Merrill? Uh, okay, we'll go on. Uh, I'll give Ian, Ian Stewart, do you have anything to add at this time? I have nothing to add. I just uh, want to say I look forward to the next chance we get to actually see each other in person. I think Alan's doing a great job, but this is we're doing our best here. Yes, uh, likewise, that will be really great. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, I see James Johnson. James Johnson, you're you are a member of the MSAB. Is that correct? Yes. Trying to remember everyone's last names right now. That's correct. <laughs> uh, do you have comments? No, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Jeff Kaufman. Jeff? Okay, well, 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 Jeff, we'll get you in the next discussion. I hope this is not just a, an instance of uh, being muted and not being able to get unmuted somehow. Uh, Jim Lane. Uh, hi, how are you doing? You hear Good. me? Yes, oh, I can hear you. Yeah, because uh, I'm using my big screen at work and then the, the odd the video stuff I haven't quite figured out. Um, I thought I had it pretty you know, the, between Chuck and Dan and, and Chris, uh, 
I thought I had it pretty clear in my mind, but now I'm a bit confused as to, okay, whatever their management procedures are, it's kind of like I thought we were evaluating them based on our current suite of objectives and what's in, what's out. If they make it, they're, that's what we would present. And the other, uh, the other um, information that goes along with them that, that is there the, for other, you know, for further things, um, I guess it would be better to have <clears throat> at some point a clear discussion of just exactly how this is going to work. And maybe that won't happen until we have some results. But to me, I thought we were evaluating as to that current objectives and, and our, our task was what met objectives and what did not. Not uh, that further going on and saying, well, we like these, we don't like those. Uh, we could do that, but I didn't see the, how that was going to change what we would present to the commissioners as to what met the objectives. Jim, I had a, I'm sorry if I interject, I had you know, a similar question. I was scribbling some notes after hearing comments from others. And I think um, what's starting to become clear to me is MSE provides a good framework to, you know, a, a good structured evaluation of um, how different procedures perform. But what I've just come to realize is that uh, um, with the number of people on the MSAB and the number of interests that are here, we almost need some sort of framework to to identify procedures. Like, uh, I don't know if there's anything in the literature that talks about advice on not so much evaluating procedures, but some structured decision-making framework for identifying procedures. We, just, we don't have enough time or enough resources to evaluate all the procedures that folks could dream up here. Um, and so we need some sort of way to uh, pare down the, the to-do list for the secretariat. Oh, I, I get that. Um, I guess my, my point was we have these management procedures um, and, you know, we're talking about some with combined constraints, some without. I, I guess my, my just thought that our first, you know, sort of hierarchical was what of, all, of the management procedures that we're going to evaluate, what meet the core objectives that the, the commission has said they, that they, we were supposed to work with. And then once that's done, and then, okay, then you're left with, these, with, with, with those. And then um, do we then repackage as Dan was saying, look at those and repackage things or, or what's the process after that? Um, is it goes to the SRB or does it pack to the commissioners? I guess I'm kind of not really clear how that goes. I mean, I get the evaluation part. What happens after? Because here's what, here's what met their objectives for conservation objectives and their other ones. And all right, now what do we do? Okay, yeah, let's let's think on that a little bit more. That's a good good point, um, Jim. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, so let's see, Joe Morelli. Uh, Joe had a couple of conflicts. He may have had to step off this morning. Okay. So maybe we can move on, and if okay. folks have been skipped over, they can come back. Yes. Um, yeah. Please let me know at the end if I skipped over any MSAB members. Uh, Maggie Summer. Nothing for me at this time. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peggy Parker. Nothing from me either, except I really think uh, it will be, we're doing a great job on Go to meeting. It will be great to see everyone in person. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, Pear. Yeah, you got me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, as Gary said, we are our objectives are somewhat set, but uh, we got to understand there's there'll be some tweaking the objectives and. Uh, the uh, management procedure has got to allow for that, some tweaking, and ultimately commissioners would decide which objectives are are going to be, you know, the ones that are most relevant to them. That's it. Thank you, Pear. Um, we'll go to Piera. Hi, everybody. 
uh, nothing from me at this, at this moment. Just uh, I hope to see you again soon <laughs> in person. Thank you, Piera. Uh, Rachel Baker. possible Rachel had to step away for a minute. Uh, we'll have to come back. Um, so let's see, I do see one commissioner online here. I see Richard Yamada. Um, I know you're not a member of the MSAB, but you're certainly very important to this process. So I want to give you an opportunity if you want to say anything. No, not at this time. Just uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you for all the work you folks have been putting in on this. Um, very interested in the process and and the work you folks are doing. So, thanks. Thank you, um, Robert. Um, yeah, I have nothing to add. To add. Okay, thank you. And then Sarah Webster. Yeah, I have nothing to add at this time. But thank you guys for organizing all of this and getting it going, even though we can't be there together. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, Scott Mazzoni. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. This meeting seems to be working out just great. Uh, my one concern, I think Chuck raised it a little bit, it seems like we're in rust in this process. So I want to make sure that we have adequate time to address all of our concerns. And if there is a discussion about having a summer meeting potentially, uh, please uh, take note of the negative tides and plan the meeting around those. Uh, thank you. Mm. Okay. Uh, all right, great. So negative tides, we need to pay attention. Uh, Tom Marking. So we see you, Tom, but we don't hear you. Is that a problem that we can resolve? Uh, or Alan or me? I wonder if I unmute. Hmm. He gave us a thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Uh, there may, may have been multiple organizers trying to unmute Tom at the same time. <laughs> um, well, Tom, um, if you want to perhaps uh, use, we, we did see you on video, so we know you're on GoToMeeting. No, Mike. Okay. Good work. <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful. You're also welcome to use the chat window if you actually do have further comments and we can't hear you. So, but that was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, that is the end of my list. Just looking down the list of attendees right now. Um, did I miss anyone? Carrie, um, I just want to note uh, Steve Barakoff, member of the MSE team, the, our programmer in Colorado. Um, just wondering if he has any comments. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know uh, I didn't know who Steve was just by first name. So thank you for yeah. any comments, Steve. There you go. I don't have any comments, but thank you for letting me um, have the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Jerry. I, and I, that's Jeff Kaufman. Okay, great, Jeff. Yeah, I I figured it out. Uh, how to work the mute and unmute button on the computer, even though I'm on the phone. So um, my apologies, no one even didn't hear me earlier as well, but I don't have anything to add at this point, but just, just testing it out here. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. Carrie, one thing I had to add was, um, I, I agree, I think, I mean, we're, we're still early on, but I think things are working pretty well, given the, uh, that it's all quite new, this meeting structure. Uh, I do wonder, though, once the meeting materials uh, change, like when we get into some more substantive conversations in October, if we were to have to have a, a go-to meeting for the October meeting, uh, I do wonder if we'll, we'll still be as successful as we've been so far. Um, I, I don't have any answers yet. I just looking ahead, I, I think it's it's plausible that we're 
we are not going to be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting or at least uh, international travel for the October meeting. So we should be prepared to think about what um, MSAB 16 might look like. Uh, let's cover that though on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adam, thank you for bringing that up. And I do think we should come back to that topic on, on Thursday. Uh, what, what might the October meeting look like and what do we need to be prepared for with that? Um, I think it's a possibility and even if travel were allowed across borders, that there would be people who are uncomfortable with that, depending on what's going on at that time. So we should think about all the possibilities. Um, great. Um, so if that's everyone, I'll give one more chance uh, for anyone who I missed to speak up or anyone who has our time in now. Hey, it's Emery. Um, Hi, this is, I'm sorry, who? Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie. Hi, Anne-Marie. Sorry, I, hi, sorry, that was me with the initials. I, uh, ah. <laughs> I should have decoded that. <laughs> <laughs> um, webinar is working great for me. Uh, I think my one concern about the meeting, the process is uh, that if we have results presented in October, that'll be the first chance that we get, or sorry, August, that'll be the first chance that we see that we see results and we'll be able to provide some alternative suggestions in terms of management procedures. To which mm -hmm. point we'll see the results in October, but then that's it. So there'll only be one chance to actually adjust management procedures between now and something that needs to go to the um, commissioners. So not sure, yeah, probably this, either the last thing that people want to hear or the second last thing that people want to hear, but is there an opportunity to have another like touch base meeting somewhere between October and the annual meeting? Perhaps we can write that down <laughs> as a question. And when we come back to talking about a summer meeting and the October meeting, we can, we can make sure that that's uh, on the agenda to discuss. And one, um, the, the between October and the annual meeting is going to be difficult, but there is the interim meeting in, in that time period um, to get some feedback from at least the commission. Yeah. I, I like Dan's suggestion. He just said if yeah. Peace Arch Park is open, we can meet there in October. <laughs> don't even have to cross the borders. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so I think we've, we've gotten a good idea of people's comments here. I've taken some notes on them. Uh, there were some comments on uh, the list of management procedures, how we're going to be efficient at that, how we're going to package it, revisiting, which I think we will do uh, later in the meeting. Uh, and also some comments about uh, summer meetings and meetings between October and the annual meeting in terms of timing and the need to consider whether things will be in person, um, people's schedules, uh, such as considering negative tides. Um, and that will also be a topic that we'll come back to and we'll note those particular points when we come back to them. Uh, so with that, let's move on to the next agenda item. Uh, which I believe is management procedures for coastwide scale uh, that the MSE team is going to present. And of course, this is a topic that we've heard about uh, and have digested before. And we've looked at the results for the uh, management procedures for coastwide scale. And so um, let's hear what uh, the MSE team uh, wants to tell us about that today. All right, thanks, Carrie. I'm gonna actually turn this presentation over to Piera. Um, and I'm going to give her control of the screen. Uh, I'm going to make her a presenter. And so, Kira, I'm about to make you a presenter. Um, and she'll give this presentation, um, which is an overview of the management procedures, what they are, and what we've been working on thus far. Great. Perfect. I can see your screen, Piera. Uh, can you also hear me? Yes, can hear you too. 
Perfect. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, nice uh, seeing you or hearing you here. And thanks for attending this meeting. Um, so this is item 04. And I think this presentation on management procedure might be useful to uh, clarify some of the questions you had uh, uh, previously, or maybe raise more questions, and uh, uh, hopefully will help the discussion also later on on management procedures. Um, so I will just go through um, what happened at the intersessional meeting very briefly, since uh, uh, Alan has already mentioned it. Um, I will then remind you what management procedures actually are. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, I will uh, uh, present you um, what, how are we uh, foresee uh, the procedure to distribute in the TCY. Um, I will go through uh, what is our current interim management procedure. And then um, I will summarize uh, what we've been deciding during uh, uh, MSAB uh, 14 uh, in terms of management procedures. So which management procedure have we decided to uh, explore and uh, um, uh yeah i will i will basically summarize uh summarize that so um, let's get started um so uh the 96th session uh, of the uh, annual meeting discussed the recommendation um on the cost and results of the msc as you uh, all remember uh, and they agreed to hold an intersessional meeting soon after uh, the uh, ma 96 to provide further direction and this intersessional meeting was very successful as, as Alan mentioned because uh, the commission actually endorsed uh, endorsed a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, in the last uh, well year and more uh, even so uh, on the cost wide MSC results the commission noted that uh, um, SPR values greater than 40 percent and actually uh, SPR values in the range between 40 to 46 percent um, a control rule of 30 to 20 and some kind of constraint on the annual change in the TCY actually meet uh, the objectives. So that was the um, that was a note uh, from the Commission. But then the uh, important outcomes was, were those two recommendations. So the first recommendation um, is that uh, the Commission recommended that the primary cost-wide and area specific objectives be used for evaluating MSC results. So uh, the Commission endorsed uh, the objective that uh, we put forward. And then the Commission recommended a reference SPR fishing intensity of 43% with the 30-20 control rule be used as an updated interim harvest policy consistent with the MSC results. So again, uh, the work that we've been doing and that we've been presenting has been uh, um, endorsed by the Commission. And this, these were great outcomes, as, uh, uh, as Alan mentioned uh, already. So, um, said that, let's go back to what we mean with management procedure. What are management procedure? So, I think you might all remember this figure. This is what we call the closed loop. So on the left, we have the operating model, and the operating model is just a, a, basically a model that tries to simulate the reality, what's happening out there. And we cannot control the operating model because the operating model depends on the ecosystem, on the biology of the fish, so it's, it's something that um, we cannot control. What we can control when we, manage, um, when we manage a fish stock is how we act on the, on the stock itself. So um, this is what the management procedure does, basically. And there are three elements to the management procedure. So there is the first element is the monitoring. So when we go out at sea, we collect data, uh, we have a survey, um, which provides us with all sorts of information. And so we collect all this data and we put all this data into an estimation model, which is a statistical model that uh, provides us with uh, some um, many uh, management related quantities and that's what Ian does when he goes away for a month and locked in his office just run those models and then when he provides us with with those uh, quantities we um, have uh, we, we can apply the harvest control rule um, the, the harvest control rule that basically um, tell us how to distribute the harvest through the regulatory areas, um, if there, there should be some size limits, uh, some catch caps and floor and so on. And all this information get back into the operating model. So that's what the closed loop does. But let's go more into detail of how the management procedure is structured. So we have the monitoring. 
Um, so when we go out at sea and we sample fish, uh, we cannot sample the whole population, that's impossible. So all the data that we collect have some uncertainty around it. And that's what we try to reproduce when we generate data from the operating model. So we, we generate data with, with error, just try to mimic the, the same uh, monitoring process. And the data that we generated are, uh, for example, indices of abundance. So we try to generate uh, the uh, survey NPUE and the commercial WPUE, and then uh, proportionate age in the catch. So these are the two main sources of information that um, we generate. Uh, and those data uh, are provided by the operating model at the regional, regional and regulatory area levels. So after the operating model generate this data, we aggregate them into a cost-wide level and we use them uh, into an estimation model. So in reality, Ian does this, this part of the uh, estimation, let's say. Um, if you remember, in the cost-wide MSE, we were just simulating uh, this estimation error. We were not actually doing any assessment. Um, on the other hand, this time on this area-based MSE, we tried to reproduce this process as, as closely as we could. And so we decided to uh, use actually part of the ensemble that Ian uses uh, to provide uh, the management-related quantities we need. And uh, uh, in particular, we chose two uh, of the um, models that Ian uses in its ensemble. And we chose the long cost-wide and the short cost-wide model. So if you remember, the ensemble is, is formed by uh, four, four models, and we chose two of those. And uh, um, so the, the choice of this model um, was driven, uh, well, first of all, practicality. Um, the two cost-wide models are a bit simpler uh, from how the data are structured. Uh, so that was a, that was one of the reasons. They are a bit faster to run. So if you consider all the simulation that we have to run and the time that this simulation takes, uh, every second counts. And so those two models actually perform in between 10 to 15 seconds uh, in the uh, streamlined version. So uh, that's what why we chose those. Uh, but yet, uh, they retain the complexity and the uncertainty captured by the uh, full stock assessment ensemble because um, the short and the long cost-wide model represent, for example, uncertainty in natural mortality rates, uh, in environmental effect on recruitment, and so on. So the uncertainty in the, of the ensemble is still retained, even though we're using only two. But for practicality reason, we had to, to you know, um, to choose um, some of the models. We couldn't use all four of them. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, we have a framework, we have the code that does that. And so we run uh, those two models and um, we get the same um, quantities that uh, uh, Ian provides. And then is when the harvest rule is, uh, is applied. And so basically the harvest rule is the application of the estimation model output to determine the mortality limits for the uh, upcoming year or years. And uh, as you know, it has a cost-wide component, which is basically our SPR, and then the distribution component. We need to distribute this uh, uh, total mortality to a regulatory area level, because that's where uh, how the fishery is managed. Uh, so before diving into uh, how we, we foresee, let's say, the distribution procedure of the TCY, I just want you to remind of uh, uh, this figure. So we've been talking about uh, that a bit already, but I just want to um, remind you of uh, the difference between the management procedure and the objectives. So we, we don't confuse them. It's really important that we keep them separated. So as you know, you've seen this figure before, I'm sure. Uh, this is uh, uh, what we call the harvest control rule. And there are a number of components to it. So first of all, the axis. So let's look at the axis, the y-axis. Um, that represents the fishing intensity. So think about it that uh, um, as, uh, um, as you increase fishing intensity, you basically go up the axis. And fishing intensity is expressed in uh, uh, SPR. SPR uh, stands for spawning potential ratio. So in an SPR concept, a very high fishing intensity is on the upper part of the y-axis. A very high fishing intensity corresponds to zero spawning potential. Basically, there are 
no fish that can spawn. But at a very low fishing intensity or no fishing intensity, you have the maximum spawning potential. So SPR is equal to 100%. Um, on the other hand, on the, um, the x-axis, um, represent uh, um, the stock status. So to the right is the unfished biomass, the one represent the unfished biomass, while to the left, the equal, the zero, um, represent no fish in the population. So it's no biomass at all. Uh, there is another element I want you to um, look at. And as you see, there are those uh, reference points and control points, and those are labeled with uh, two different colors. So in blue, you have the control point, which are defined by the management procedure. And in red, you have the um, reference point or biomass objectives, which are defined by the objectives. And I will go more into uh, that in a second. So um, the height of the line of this uh, harvest rule is the reference is the reference fishing intensity, which is also called input SPR or procedural SPR. Uh, so is the condition where we normally would operate under, right? In a normal condition when everything is fine, we would operate around this SPR that according to the uh, intersectional meeting is now set to uh, 43%. So before it was 46 and now it's 43%. Um, so if the stock status falls below uh, what we call a fishery trigger, then we would start decrease the fishing intensity, right? Until the stock status either recover or if the stock status fall below a fishery limit, uh, then we would basically close the fishery. And in the current situation in the um, Alibut um, interim management procedure, we are using a control rule of 3020, so which means that our fishery trigger is at 30%. Um, and the uh, fishery limit is at 20 percent. Um, as you can see in this plot, in this case, both our control point and reference point are at the same at the same level and as the same for the trigger and the threshold. But this doesn't have to be the case. So, for example, if you remember, uh, during the coastwide MSC, you tested the control rule that was uh, 2510. So that means that with the control rule of 2510, your trigger will actually be slightly to the left. So your ramp would start at a lower level of stock, of uh, stock biomass. And your fishery limit as well would be at the left of your biomass objective because your biomass objective was still at 20%. So you still didn't want to go lower to 20% biomass, but you were actually going to zero fishery only when the biomass was below 10%. So just to, to let you know that those two, um, uh, let's say those two elements don't need to be the same. And that's where the difference between the management procedure and the objectives comes in. Um, as you can see, the target in this plot is to the right of your trigger. And that's what you actually um, what you actually want. Uh, as Adam mentioned as well, um, you want to be at the target and you would be at the target 50% of the time, which means that sometime you will be below the target, sometime you will be above the target. So if this target is too close to the ramp, you probably enact the ramp quite often and this might be something that you want to avoid. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, um, yeah, that's just a reminder of uh, uh, why it is important to distinguish between uh, what the objectives are that have been defined and are um, different from the management procedures. Um, so now we can actually dive in into uh, how we, we see the procedure for uh, distributing the TCY. So as you can see, there are, um, four steps. So not all these steps are, um, are necessary in the sense that you could, from a coastwide level, you could go directly to a regulatory area level. So from point one, you could go directly to point three, or you could have an intermediate step and uh, um, split uh, the TCY to distribute the TCY to a um, biological region level. So 
the last step, on the other hand, is just the policy based, uh, and uh, I will go um, more into detail of that. Um, as you can see, uh, step one to three have a science based component and a management derived component, and uh, you'll see why. So let's start with uh, the first required step. We need a coast wide target fishing intensity, which in this case is um, our um, SPR 43%. So um, we determine the coast wide total mortality. And this is the science based part because uh, that's the assessment model, right? The assessment model provides us with the total mortality. Uh, and then we separate uh, this total mortality into AO26, uh, which is the actual PCY, and the um, U26 um, non directed fishing discard mortality component. And that's uh, the more management uh, derived part. Um, of this first step. And then, optional, we could uh, distribute the stock to a biological region level. And to do that, um, we could use the stock distribution um, uh, from uh, estimated from the WPOE index. So, so we use our survey to distribute the stock to a biological region, region level. Um, we can then further adjust the distribution to take into account other factors still science based. So, for example, we know that there are differences in productivity between two areas. So we might want to adjust uh, the relative fishing intensity or we know something about migration. And so we want to adjust uh, the regional the regional fishing intensity. And these are all science based um, um, components. Uh, but then we might want, for example, to further adjust this regional allocation to account for other factors, which can be, uh, I don't know, other economic factors or uh, simply negotiation, negotiation. So this is the more management, uh, the right component. And so the last step uh, of this uh, distributing uh, of this uh, uh, distribution of the TCY is moving uh, the TCY to a regulatory area allocation level. So again, we can use the stock distribution, we can derive the stock distribution using proportion of the stock estimated from the WPOE index. So again, science based, we use the survey, but then we can further adjust this uh, um, distribution um, to this uh, regulatory area allocation to consider for other factors, again, can be economic factors or uh, um, social factors or, again, negotiations. Um, and this is the last step and is required because we need to get to a, a regulatory area allocation. Um, finally, uh, there is this kind of policy component of the harvest strategies, and this is occurs as a final step where here, other objectives are considered, again, economic and social uh, objectives or something else. Uh, and this uh, um, policy adjust, this is policy component can actually implies a departure from uh, the reference SPR. This might be, for example, a desired outcome. OK, for this year, we are going to depart from our SPR 43 and use an SPR 40. Of course, when we do that, we should keep in mind that uh, um, we might deviate from, well, we, we are actually deviating from the management procedure and the long-term management objectives. And this departure um, may result in some unpredictable longer-term out outcomes. Um, okay, so this is how we uh, think that the procedure for distributing the TCEY should work. Um, let's go now into just briefly um, how the current interim uh, management procedure um, harvest po strategy policy uh, looks like. So as you probably all remember, we have a scale component that is the one we've been talking about. We have a cost wide assessment with a, a cost wide fishing intensity and a 30-20 um, control rule, which provides us with a total mortality. 
we divide the total mortality between a U26 component and the O26 component, which is actually our TCEY, and then we distribute this TCEY to regulatory areas. So our reference SPR is 43%, we have a 30 to anti harvest control rule, and uh, uh, right now for the distribution component, um, we um, estimated, we, we use the estimates from the space-time model, O32 WPOE, uh, for each IPHC regulatory area. And then we have a um, harvest rate adjustment. Um, so uh, Western area have a slightly uh, lower harvest rate compared to um, Eastern area. Um, and then uh, the current interim uh, procedure added the further adjustment to the distributed TCY in 2019, uh, which uh, uh, I believe should go, yes, it should go until uh, uh, 2022. So it's a kind of a short term agreement, uh, which include a fixed uh, 1.65 million pounds for IPHC regulatory year 2A, and then allocation for IPHC regulatory year 2B, which is based on stock distribution and a fixed percentage. So this is, our interim management procedure. That's what we are operating under right now. But so let's see what uh, MS, MSAB 14 has proposed. And I just want to point out that the definition of uh, uh, those, uh, um, those management procedure that we decided to consider um, has actually taken quite a long time, you know, has been part of a process and, uh, um, and uh, uh, for example, um, there has been uh, uh, specific elements uh, that uh, were requested for evaluation and that have been discussed and then have been put into uh, those management procedures. So this, these specific elements are in particular the use of a constraint. So for example, the slow up, fast down and the maximum change in the TCY. Um, it was a, a request to consider uh, the um, different relative harvest rate across uh, IPHC regulatory areas or biological region. Uh, it was uh, asked to consider distributing the TCY directly to IPHC regulatory areas, so from a coast-wide level to a regulatory area levels without passing through, let's say, the biological region stage. Um, it was asked to consider a fixed share concept for all or some IPHC regulatory areas, biological region or management zones uh, with option to distribute the TCY to the areas without the fixed shares. And the determination of the, uh, the determination of this share may be fixed or vary or varying over time. Um, and then finally, uh, it was asked to um, evaluate um, to set a maximum fishing intensity uh, defined by an SPR of 36% to act as a buffer when distributing the TCY to IPHC regulatory areas. So those were the elements that kind of guided uh, the, the definition of the management procedure listed in uh, table, well, both table one and table uh, two of the of appendix six of the MSAB report. Uh, so you can find uh, this set of management procedure, uh, as I mentioned, in the um, MSAB 014 report in Appendix 6. We have two tables. Um, the, tool considers, uh, the, the tools considered um, within all these management procedure are survey estimates. So the survey estimate has been, uh, uh, it, it's a, been a very important component in each one of those management procedures to distribute the TCY to both the regulatory area and the biological region level. Uh, fishery dependent data, such as trend in CPUE by biological region uh, or regulatory area. And then some uh, practical tools, such as uh, the relative harvest rate, for example. So having lower harvest rate in some region compared to other, um, or percentage allocation to IPHC regulatory area or proportion of adopted TCY. So there are kind of those three tools that have been uh, used in the management procedure proposed. So one uh, common thing throughout all the management procedure is uh, the coast-wide uh, TCY component. So all the management procedure use a reference SPR of 43% and a 30 to 20 harvest control rule. 
some of the management procedure apply constraint. Uh, and in particular, as uh, we've been uh, noticing before, uh, they apply uh, the, um, the combination of a, a slow up, fast down, and a, a max change uh, uh, 15%. Uh, for distributing the TCY, the main tool has been the O32 stock distribution. Uh, most of the management procedure distribute directly to regulatory areas. So I think there are only two that uh, uh, goes through the biological region step. Um, different management procedure test different relative harvest rate adjustments. So some uh, get a lower harvest rate for Western area, some other uh, put an equal uh, weight to most of the area. Um, and then uh, most of the management procedure have the uh, interim adjustment for regulatory area 2A and 2B. Um, so this, uh, this is uh, how the management procedure look like. Um, these are the main tools used and uh, um, the, the constraint used and so on. So just a quick recap of the constraints. What do they actually mean? So two constraints have been used in this management procedure proposed that are the max change both 15%, in which the total mortality is constrained to change no more than 15% um, both ways, and then a slow up fast down, in which uh, uh, the total mortality increases by one third of the increase suggested by the harvest control rule, but, and decreases by half of the decrease suggested by the harvest control rule. There are some other constraints that were actually tested um, in the coastwide MSC, which are the max change both 20%. Um, so instead of 15% uh, maximum change is a 20% maximum change, and the maximum change up 15%. So the constraint is applied only when uh, the TCY increase. And then a slow up full down in which the total mortality increases by one third of the increase suggested by the harvest control rule, but then it takes a full decrease uh, that is suggested by the harvest control rule. And then uh, a fixed uh, mortality limits for a number of years, which uh, uh, I think it was tested for three years. So reviewing the TCY only every three years. So these are the constraints. The first two, the max change both and the slow up fast down, are the ones that have actually been uh, suggested uh, in the management procedure proposed, so are actually being used in the management procedure proposed. Um, so now I will just go through some consideration about the tools that I've just listed that have been used uh, in the proposed uh, management procedure, and I hope that this might, might help uh, with the discussion and eventually the revision um, of the management procedure proposed. So first of all, um, I think all of the management procedure proposed, at least in the short list, uh, they use the O32 stock distribution um, instead of the whole sizes. However, the whole sizes stock distribution is largely composed of over 26 uh, Pacific Alibut due to the selectivity of the set line gear. So to use the all sizes would be more congruent with the uh, actual TCY. So this is something to uh, consider. Um, then again, most of the most of the management procedure move directly from a coastwide total mortality to a regulatory area uh, TCY. However, um, I just want you to remind you that the conservation objective are at a, at a biological region level. So it might not be the case, but what could happen is that you actually don't meet the objective at the biological region because you you um, you don't take into consideration that step, and this is something that will be evaluated, and um, it's something that yeah we need that we need to um, to take into account. Um, then um, I think all of the management procedure use the interim adjustment. So if you remember the 1.65 pound fix for uh, um, 2A and the fixed percentage for 2B. Um, and this may or may not uh, limit yield in years when the stock biomass is very high. So, for example, if you have a stock, uh, if you have a fixed value for the TCY, you want 1.65 million pounds. In years in which the stock biomass is high, you wouldn't actually um, uh, you wouldn't actually use the extra uh, TCY. 
Uh, and then uh, um, if the stock status, on the other hand, uh, is low, uh, so in times of reduced productivity, you might not just be able to get your 1.65 million pounds. So this is also something that uh, uh, we should keep in mind. And then uh, um, there is this, this discussion about constraints versus no constraints. And uh, we've had the discussion quite a bit already this morning. Um, so um, a lot of the management procedure don't use any constraint. Uh, and again, um, if uh, we remember, if you remember from the um, results from the cost wide MSC, uh, we observed that there were a lot of trade offs between catch stability and catch opportunities. So if you want more catch stability, you might give up a bit of catch opportunities and vice versa. If you don't care about stability, you can just uh, um, exploit. Um, yeah, you can just uh, get a bit more opportunities. Um, However, uh, the use of the constraint, both at the cost-wide or at area level, might actually help satisfying all of the objectives. So, so again, uh, the use of constraint is something that maybe uh, you want to take uh, into account a bit more in your management procedure. Um, and then just a final consideration is that, uh, um, uh, is that some of the management procedure um, can become very complex. Uh, due to the combination of multiple element, elements and in general uh, we we do encourage to keep them simple as much as we can uh, because that will facilitate transparency uh, in the overall process and it just make it easier to uh, to understand um, so yeah that's uh, that's all i've got and uh, um, we're open for questions and sorry, I figured out I didn't have the camera on. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Piera. Uh, I see that we do have a question from Dan. Yeah, just real quick, Piera. Thanks for the presentation. Um, when we were talking about the F max concept, I noticed that you carried forward F36, which is one of the, the numbers we discussed at the October meeting, but we also looked at something a little more conservative that didn't take us so close to MSY all the time of F40. Did you guys, uh, and you guys were going to consider that if time was available, and I just wondered if you had any follow-on thoughts on using the max at F40 or versus F46 or where we go from here. Um, so I guess, so I guess uh, we, you, we decided on the 36%, if I recall the discussion, that was because it was the lower limit that we could we'd consider acceptable, let's say. Um, we surely can test something else. I mean, I guess this is uh, up for discussion on uh, uh, what people feel comfortable with and uh, uh, on uh, the, also based on, on the results that we will get. But I'm not sure if Alan has uh, more comments on that. Yeah, thanks, Pierre. Thanks, Dan. The, um... We, we haven't put a whole lot of thought into that one quite yet, um, but I imagine the 36%, if I remember right, was put into the minutes of the MSAB 14 report, and it was sort of a verbal agreement that we would in, investigate potential other limits, like the 40%. So um, we'll, we'll think about that, and that might be something good to note um, in this report. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, all right, that's, that's helpful. So when we do talk about management procedures going forward, maybe we'll kind of bookmark that one to discuss what the FMAX should be and if there's an option or two we want to make sure we capture in the minutes this time. That sounds great, thanks. Uh, I see Chuck and Peggy. Chuck first and then Peggy. Yes, thanks. Uh, I, I suppose right now we're asked to recommend the use of the biological, moving through biological regions as being useful. And at this particular point in time, I'm at this point in time in the meeting, I am a little uncomfortable in actually moving forward with a recommendation, which this PowerPoint is suggesting and it is certainly in the document. So we can hear more why it's important to go to the biological region first. I mean, it's really apportioning at a larger scale, and then we're still trying to deal with it and find it probably going to be more constraining for even having the discussion down the line. Uh, 
I personally feel maybe, I personally think at this time, adequate, maybe best is to move straight to the regulatory uh, area discussions as and, and bypass the and biological regions. I just don't think it's valuable in this process. And that's it for right now, thanks. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Peggy? May I follow up on that? Um, oh, real sure. Quick, Carrie, yeah. is that okay? Yeah. Sorry to interject there. Um, but um, yeah, Chuck, Chuck I, I hear what you're saying. We've had been having this discussion for a while. We've had this discussion with the SRB as well. And there may be reasons to go through the, the region first before uh, distributing to the regulatory areas. And um, we, we can investigate and evaluate some of those outcomes with the MSE. But some of the reasons that we might want to go to a region first and distribute to a region first is um, the method of distribution. So, for example, when using uh, the survey um, O32, for example, the, the survey O32 is going to have probably a, a better, uh, less uncertainty at the region level than at the uh, regulatory area level. And, and the classic example on that one is um, regulatory area 2A. The survey can fluctuate quite a bit just due to the natural uncertainty in the survey of that regulatory area. But going to that region sort of buffers against some of that uncertainty. And then you might choose different ways to then allocate to the regulatory area from within that region. That's one reason. Um, is the, the data that you're basing it on. Another reason you might want to go to the region first is just the biology of Pacific halibut and that the concept that Pacific halibut within the summer during the fishery tend to move around within the region and not a lot between regions during that time. So the, it, it, it's a more natural size area for thinking about allocating or distributing the, the TCY on that broad level. Um, but of course, we do have to get to the regulatory area eventually. And that's why we, we have it open right now for the two different methods where the region is optional. We may go through the region and we then can go to um, regulatory area directly or through region to get there. What I can try to do is remember some of the documents where we described um, some of the benefits of going to region first. Uh, it might have been in a MSAB 13 document or a 14 document, or um, it was probably in an earlier one, but we've been having that discussion for a while. Um, and we're open to investigating management procedures that do both. Thanks. I think, thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, does that show, so we move on to the next topic? Um, and um, Peggy? Thanks, Carrie, and thanks, no, Kira. That, that, that was a great presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, on slide 20 of the presentation, I just had a clarifying question. The first bullet says O32 versus all sizes, and it occurred to me when I was reading this, I've seen this before, um, that we are, at least for some issues, looking at uh, other um, data sets besides our survey to cover the smaller sizes, 0 to 26. And I wondered if this is something that we might consider later to look at the full, full stock of all sizes of halibut. Um, Maybe not in this go round, but but if if any component of bycatch is going to be evaluated by the MSC, that would be an important thing to look at. Sure, if I may just respond real quick. Um, yeah, I think the all sizes is an important concept to remember. It um, and and mainly from a theoretical standpoint is that the survey, what, what is first of all meant by all sizes is what the survey sees. So it's not all sizes of halibut. It's probably not actually um, 
measuring much, or well, it's it's measuring what of some of the bycatch or the non-directed discard mortality is, but it's not measuring those say age two to five year olds. The set line survey doesn't see a lot of fish uh, less than age six, I believe. But it's just right now there's a little bit of an inconsistency of distributing the TCY based on O32 versus distributing the TCY based on mostly O26. Um, and as been noted in past MSAB meetings, there could be a reason to use O32 um, for various reasons of um, focusing more on the landed catch and taking into account some, some of the potential non-directed discard mortality in the different regions or regulatory areas. But it again is something that we're interested in investigating in the MSC to see what are the benefits of going to all sizes or not. Peggy, did you have a follow-up question to that? I sort of do. Uh, when you say all sizes, you're looking at 26 and over, correct? In this context? It's mostly, it, yeah, it's mostly O26. It, it's what the survey catches. Um, and the right. survey catches and mostly O26. I, I think it, and uh, Ian, feel free to chime in and correct me. It's one or two percent that I think is less than 26 inches from the survey. Um, but it's a small percentage, but all sizes does include that, those occasional small under 26 inch fish that are caught. Yeah, and that's in the context of the directed fishery. So I'm with you on that. I'm just. The all sizes that. only in, in a concept related to the fishery independent set line survey um, in how we analyze those data. The O26 in the, well, the TCY is actually all mortality other than the um, U26 component of non-directed discard mortality. So the TCY also does contain some U26 um, mortality as well. And this is a reminder, we always we have this discussion a lot, especially when we're in the office having the hallway discussions that we need to really clear up these terms and make them a little bit more accurate, you might say. Yeah, my question was really in the big picture of what we're evaluating and uh, whether or not it would be productive to think about the other data sources, which of course Ian is familiar, you both, everyone there is familiar with them, um, that we're not using here. And, and I'm presuming that's because what we're looking at is the directed, we're looking at doing a management strategy evaluation of the directed fishery uh, harvest control rule and harvest policy, harvest policy. So I'm sort of answering my own question, but I just wanted to clarify that um, even though we're talking about the full, all sizes of the stock, we're really only talking about 026 and up. It, that, that, that's most, yeah, that, that, that's correct for now. We're really focusing on that directed portion of the fishery. Okay. And here, all sizes in the set line survey refers to um, the, what is caught in the set line survey. When we okay. do analyses and evaluations, we'll be showing potentially other, um, the smaller fish in, in the population model. Okay, thank you. Ian, did you have a follow up to that? Just to clarify that we're talking about the, purely the distribution step. Which, which of these different slices of the population are being used to do, to define the distribution? We're still modeling all of the mortality in the MSE and in the assessment. So it's really just one single step. And it doesn't preclude us, any choice here doesn't preclude us from still investigating the effects of all the different sizes of mortality, both in the MSE and in all other analyses. Uh, thank you. So it looks like uh, Jim had a comment next. Yeah, I um, just want to uh, follow up on what Chuck said. I I'm not ready to make a recommend that you know bioregion is the way to go. Um, I'm not saying don't evaluate it that way, but you know I'm and also I'm you know I'm not convinced. One of one of the reasons for bioregion is if one of the objectives and you know it's been stated you know quite clearly from the Canadian side is a national share. 
if you go to bioregion before you do that, now you don't have a national share, you have a share of a bioregion. So that kind of, that's not really what the objective is about. And also, um, I'm not sure you can characterize the fishery as being a summer fishery anymore, like it was 25, 30 years ago. In, in some areas, maybe way out west it is, but certainly in others, you know, the fishery starts in the, you know, the first or second week in March and goes to the sec the first, second week of November. And, and that is, you know, the what market really drives a lot of, and Peggy can probably understand this more than I do, market kind of drives a lot of the, you know, how much gets sort of fish in there to a certain degree. Um, so I, to me, I think that's, uh, I think the fishery is way more complex now and, and movement, uh, I'm all right if fish aren't moving around much in the summer, but there's this uh, west to east migration overall. Um, yeah, I don't think we can just not sort of, I don't know how you account for that. And by uh, bioregion saying, well, we'll just do it in the summertime, but meantime, the rest of the year they're moving. So, or there's some movement, which we don't know about. So that makes it really challenging. So I'm just saying that it, to me, it's not a done deal that bioregion is the best way to go. And um, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm closed minded about that, but that for, and for other reasons. Um, yeah, thanks, Jim. Can I just uh, reply quickly to that? Um, I Yes, in the presentation, I'm suggesting that it might be the way to go, but I'm not uh, um, saying that is the way to go. So uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, evaluating and uh, um, evaluating both uh, situation and uh, uh, look at the results will actually uh, tell us if uh, going directly uh, to regulatory area is perfectly fine or uh, if we might need these intermediate steps. So uh, I'm not uh, closing. Uh, yeah, I'm not close minded about that either. No, no, I, I understand that, right? But I, I you know, yeah, the, the secretary doesn't bring up ideas that doesn't think it wants to, to, to really flesh out and stuff, right? So they brought up the bioregions two or three years ago, and and I'm I'm just saying okay, uh, but like you said, we want to see some of these other things, and and a bioregion may not you know uh, be appropriate for the type of management procedure that we'd like to see evaluated. Sure. Adam, it's uh, Carrie. It's Chris Four. Um, can uh, uh, is this directly related to this topic? Um, we've got uh, Dan has been waiting to speak as well. I don't know if he's speaking on. Oh yeah, no, no, just put put me on the list. Put me on the list, thanks. Okay, great, will do. Um, Dan, well, I just find myself agreeing with Jim and Chuck that you know I I think it's premature to have that as our recommendation at this point in the meeting because we haven't seen the results that dictate that regions are the best one, and so I mean I. I guess, you know, rather than spending a lot of time on our report writing on this, I'd be more comfortable if we wait to make a recommendation on region versus area until we've seen the results later this summer. And then in terms of the third bullet that all the tools are to be considered are already ones that have listed, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to make that recommendation or minutes until after our discussion under scope of program of work under number seven and we see what those final options are or management procedures are. We want to carry forward. The one that I noticed was not so far, I can put my finger on and what's been presented was the idea of a rolling average. Where I think at the last meeting, we had a couple of examples where you'd have a three or a five year moving average to find your shares based on the survey, um, to provide some stability across years and yet track major trends. And that seems to have gotten dropped out of this final table. Um, and so I'm not ready to say that all the tools are on the table until I understand what happened to that one. So maybe we could hold this part of the report until after we have that discussion later on in our meeting. Okay, so just bringing rolling averages back into the discussion. Um, Chuck, I think you've been waiting to talk and then uh, Chris after that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess my talk, well, my topic is, or the question is on this 032 versus all sizes. And maybe I'm getting too much into the weeds or thinking too much on this, but this is a set line survey which de which determines our distribution, our coastwide distribution uh, of the biomass, well, and the distribution later through apportionment. 
uh, or the new word distribution. Now we've moved from O32 to less than even O26. And I'm just wondering how are we including the U26 then into what the set line survey is saying and same with the O26 that actually can offset if, if the if the if the technically are available TAC then is increased or the way of looking at the, 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 the fish is it possible that we are then technically offsetting mitigation on bycatch be it U26 and O26 in any way or are we still only going to be discussing O32 when it comes to the distribution? Pierre or yeah, yeah. Alan, would you like to respond? Yeah. Sure. Um, the, the the use of the what what we we're talking about here in the O32 versus the all sizes is simply what is used to determine the proportion of the stock in each regulatory area, for example, and that is then used as you noted in the distribution of the TCY to there, along with any other elements of that distribution procedure. So the, the, the one, another thing to remember is that all sizes is, re, is referring to only the set line survey, which is a very small percentage of U26, um, and it's measuring the, the, the population of all sizes caught by that set line survey in each of those regulatory areas. The, um, this, would not, this would not be in, in any way related to the mitigation for the U26 bycatch mortality. It's, it's a separate concept of that, and it actually is not measuring much of the U26 that would be encountered by any of the bycatch fisheries in any regulatory area as well, since it's a hook and line, set line survey um, that mainly catches O26 fish. So um, yeah, I'd say where we're at in the MSC now is we're not addressing any of that bycatch issue, that, that mitigation um, issue in the MSC right now. Uh, that'll be a task further um, down the road once we get this done. Okay, thanks. I'm still pondering, but thank you. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, I had a actual follow up on. Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Uh, either way. Uh, Chris, go ahead. I, I, was, I, clear, I had a, a few clarifying points that I'll bring up afterwards. Maybe if I hear your clarifying points, it might answer one of my questions. So why don't you go ahead, Adam, and then I'll ask. Okay. Uh, it's a very Canadian standoff. No, after you. Um, uh, the question I had was the one for the group around um, O32 and all sizes distribution. The recommendations that came forward in uh, October 2019 were that everyone was pretty... Um, content it seemed to talk about uh, O32 distribution rather than all sizes, at least for the first suite of management procedures that the secretary was going to evaluate. And I'm curious to hear from MSAB members about why that was the case. Was it a matter of familiarity or, uh, or, or yeah, why were, why were folks happy to talk about O32 distribution rather than all sizes? Was that a conscious decision or, or more a default? Um, so that, that's a question for the group that maybe some folks could could speak up to. Uh, the other question I had was a clarification about um, a constraints, but maybe I will uh, I'll wait until Chris has had uh, his question asked. And then the third was the bioregions versus regulatory area piece, um, building off some of the comments earlier. Uh, I'm still unclear ab about the basis for that recommendation about. Um, um, why why go to regions first? Alan mentioned two points. One was that the surveys have quite a bit of variability, and so if that's the, the distribution tool being used, it could result in quite a variable distribution. Uh, that seems reasonable, although you could maybe address it with something like slow, um, a constraint. The second piece, though, is that it, it's maybe a more, a more natural distribution, and it may help us I guess meet our uh, conservation objectives for those for those regions. Uh, that I don't follow. I mean, we, we can have, we, I mean, we could distribute biomass based on the number of bananas in the grocery store, uh, and then evaluate that way and see that it's not a very good 
procedure to meet our objective. But um, I was unclear on that on that justification, and maybe that clarification on um, why going to regions first is important could help folks um, put forward some advice. Because so far, from what we've heard from a number of folks, is they're not comfortable yet recommending uh, um, going to regions over regulatory areas. So that was a lot of questions. One was on this uh, O32 versus uh, all sizes, like to hear from the group on that. The other was why going to bioregions first might help us better meet our conservation objectives. I'm wondering if we should let Chris speak and then come back and tackle those questions one at a time. Yeah. Okay, great. Chris? So my uh, my questions are kind of related to this discussion, so maybe we could just start that discussion. I mean, I guess the, the, the you know I, I I understand now some clarity over what O32 versus all sizes actually means. I wasn't I wasn't clear on that, but I've got that now. But I guess you know we we talked about O32, and that's what we presently use. And I guess the thing is uh, for distribution, then moving to all sizes. I think it's really trying to understand, okay, what are the implications of that? Um, so I think that's why, you know, I have some questions about that. The other thing with respect to the, uh, you know, I echo Dan's comments and others about um, looking at the recommendation, I'm not comfortable with it yet, or the tools until we have some further discussions. So I think we should hold on those. I mean, for me, for the question of moving for, um, you know, do we go to coastwide to regulatory area, to regulatory area or coastwide to region or to um, then to regulatory area. I, I guess my thought was, well, isn't that what we're here testing? Isn't that what we're simulating? We're, we're gonna look at different management procedures and see how they meet the objectives. So um, I, I'm not sure, I'm not so comfortable with just without seeing some results and talking uh, a little bit more on that. Oh, okay, uh, so that was related. We, we've also got one comment or a couple of questions from Anne-Marie that are related. So um, uh, I can relay Anne-Marie's comments if that is okay, Anne-Marie. And, um, and then perhaps we can uh, consider those within the discussion of um, Adam's questions. So um, Anne-Marie says, in regard to O32 versus all sizes, one question is, is landed catch mostly O32? And two, is most of the modeled catch most, is most of the modeled catch mostly O32? If both answers are yes, then it seems like O32 makes sense. Uh, and so uh, does the Secretariat perhaps want to comment on, uh, on that quickly? Ian? Looks like Ian has turned on his webcam. He might yes. be good. <laughs> yeah, I saw you that. pop up and then I just thought you'd start speaking. <laughs> sure, I was just making sure I wasn't breaking the rules of etiquette here. Um, it, there are several sources of mortality in the directed fishery that are O26 but U32. So there's a large fraction now of the recreational mortality, all the commercial discards, as well as subsistence. So there's plenty of mortality that occurs that's U32. In some regards, this the use of the of O32 is a throwback to when basically everything under U32 was just ignored in all the calculations. And the the reason this keeps coming up is because in 2010, when there was a transition made to include all the O26 components in what was then the FCEY, there was no similar transition made with for stock distribution. And so we developed essentially just a logical inconsistency. It doesn't matter in, in, in terms of the MSE process, either, either or both can be tested. Um, we're still including all that mortality in the various calculations. So it's not like we're, we're doing what we used to do decades ago, which is actually ignore those sources of mortality. This is really just which kind of tool is gonna to be applied in the subsequent analysis. And I think, I think it was Chris made the point that some of this just remains to be seen in the results. If one performs better than the other in the results, then we really don't need to spend a lot of time arguing about it. Thank you, Ian. Um, shall we let Dan speak? Oh, 
I was just going to address Chris's comment on why 032 versus all sizes, if that's what we're talking I about. I think that's the next question anyway, so that's great. I mean, my, my recollection of it is that it's tied to what the commercial size limit is now, that we did have an objective that's kind of been in the parking lot of minimizing wastage that we've never really pulled forward a whole lot, but it's been on the discussion quite a bit. And I think there's been two proposals in front of the commissioners to reduce the size limit from 32 to 26 that have not gotten traction. And so, you know, 032 seems like a reasonable option as long as there's a 32 inch size limit on the commercial catch in order to reduce wastage. And that's kind of where most of my interest has come from in seeing that carried forward. In terms of looking at 026 as well, I think that's fine. Like Chris said, you know, let's look at one or two examples of it and see, you know, how it contrasts. But I recall at the end of the October meeting, we we're also really looking at ways to minimize the number of alternatives we're looking at. And so rather than duplicate every one of the management procedures as 032 versus 026, you know, I think the the dominant interest was to maintain 032 until the size limit changes. But we can look at a scenario or two that looks at 026 just to inform us how distribution might change um, with that to look at, but kind of minimize the number of runs we do on 026 for time and efficiency. That's my recollection. Thank you, Dan. Are there other comments? I had a clarification on the constraints piece. I think, Pierre, the point you had made was that um, uh, an acknowledgement that the constraints were uh, not, when we discussed constraints, we didn't discuss them that much, both at the regulatory area and at the coast-wide level. Um, I think it's the next slide uh, that was summarized. Um, and so the, the discussion here was that maybe constraints at both regulatory area and coast-wide would be helpful. My recollection in October, maybe it was in, in Sitka, was that um, there was some feeling that it may be redundant to have constraints at both levels. Um, if they were, for example, if they were already at the regulatory area, they're not really necessary at, at coastwide. Um, now, are, are there some other interim results that have indicated it'd be helpful to have them at both, or is this more um, a hypothesis about how we could move forward? Uh, no, I, I remember that we discussed that as well, if uh, having constraint both at the coastwide level or at the regulatory area level and so on. Uh, but then uh, in the management procedure proposed, um, they are only at the coastwide level. So that was just a reminder to people that, you know, it's something to think about and it might not make any difference. And as you say, it might be redundant, but it's something they might be interested to explore or is something that we might need to do if, uh, you know, constraint on a, uh, at the coastwide level uh, actually is not enough to limit, for example, 15% change in some uh, areas at the regulatory area level. So, uh, it, yeah, it was just something to, to remember. Um, well, that, that's helpful. Thanks very much. Um, were those the two uh, questions that on you that wanted point to about the constraints real quick, just to follow yeah. up on Adam's comment? So I think there, there might be also addressing two different sources of variability versus the coastwide versus the area. I mean, I think on the coastwide, you know, you have variability in the survey, but you also have variability in the recruitment estimates that affect the whole coastwide tax. The 2012 year class is a great example on that. So you may want to have some constraint at the coastwide level to account for incoming year class uncertainty and the effect of that on SPR. And then you may need to have an additional constraint or may not at the area level to accommodate survey variability and changes. So I think you kept them both on the table because there might be a there might be more than one driver of variability. And we wanted to see if we had enough tools to address each of those. Yes, thanks for that, Dan. I remember that conversation now. That's a good point, is that there's some different sources of variability that we might be trying to constrain. Good point. Other comments or questions that Adam posed? Adam, um, you, you, you had the question about bioregions versus regulatory areas, um, and yeah. why is going to regions first going to help us meet our conservation objectives? 
Um, and I, j I just want to note that, first off, in related to that, we're um, we're interested in testing both approaches. One going directly to regulatory areas, and second going to regions. Um, and I. I don't know which one will be better at meeting conservation objectives. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but the conservation objectives are at the biological region level and thus going distributing to those biological regions is sort of a um, logical way to, to put together a management procedure if you wanted to meet that objective. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to. It's the same thing as putting a um, putting a ramp or a target or a ramp somewhere because you don't want variability or, or be, because you don't want to go below some threshold, but in fact you're trying to meet the objective of reducing the variability. You don't need to have the objective and the management procedure doing the exact same thing. We can just make sure that we meet the objective by invoking some management procedure. So we're open to, to investigating both. Going to the, the, the regional level does sort of align with our hypothesis about the population, but as was noted, uh, a lot of the fishing mortality is occurring outside the summertime when fish might be migrating across these, um, these regions in, to, to new regions. But I would note under that hypothesis, that means that fishing mortality is occurring at different times in different regulatory areas when potentially fish are really moving around a region. So allocating to a regulatory area might just not make sense in, in general based on distribution at all because distribution is based on a survey that occurs at a specific point in time and fishing mortality occurs at a very different point in time with a different abundance of fish. So perhaps it's logical to distribute to a region and then use some other metric that's more aligned with when fishing mortality is occurring, CPUE or something like that, to allocate to the regulatory area. But I think, you know, there, there's a lot of different reasons for putting these management procedures together. It's not an easy task. We have, um, you know, we're trying to keep them to a minimum, yet we have a lot of ideas and things we want to investigate. So um, it's, it's a really difficult task. And I think we've done a good job so far keeping it to a minimum and we'll keep investigating and, and learning more as we go along. Forrest. Yeah. Um, look, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we if we go to regions first before we go to area and uh, and a region only qualifies for so much of the uh, coastwide TCY, and then we're talking about national shares uh, for 2B, whose hide does that come out of if if there's a, a regional step first? I mean, I'm always concerned. That I, I'm not a proponent of national shares, and I've vocalized that before in our meetings, but I, I'm just really precautionary that I don't know enough to make sure that this doesn't happen, but if, if what 2B removals, if 2B removals and 2A removals are higher, than what the survey suggests. If we look at it at a 2C region, you know, is, or I mean, uh, area two region, are, is 2C going to be paying more of a price for that? And maybe those adjustments would be made uh, in the management procedure using different, you know, something different, but I, and hopefully I'm not seeing it right, but I do have a concern there. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Forrest. That's a really good point. And I think what we have to realize is that there are certain elements of the distribution management procedure that are not compatible with each other. And I think distributing to regions first and having a national share in 2B or just some share to a specific regulatory area, those two concepts are not compatible. Um, it, it, it would be a difficult way to work it, and I don't think it would that we could really find a really equitable way to to make that happen. Um, with that being said, we could get into more complex management procedures where, say, areas or regions three and four are allocated to, but 2C, 2B, and 2A are 
directly allocated to those, but I don't think we're in the place to get that complex right now. And so I think what we can do is just um, recognize that maybe some elements are not compatible with other. If we're going to national shares, that has to be distributing to regulatory areas directly. So, uh, Alan, that raises another point. Well, it reminds me of two points. Um, one is this concept of management zones over regular biological regions. So I don't know, like th that hasn't really been discussed and uh, reminds me of the second point that I was negligent to not acknowledge that um, Michelle Culver has uh, resigned from MSAB. She's had uh, another opportunity that's conflicted with this, but uh, I can hear Michelle's voice in my head uh, asking us to remember management zones as opposed to biological regions. And um, I realized I hadn't really thought about where that's ended up in this, this process. Yeah, just real quick, and Tom, I realize you're waiting in line there, but um, to answer that real quick, Adam, I think that's a, that, that is an example of where management zones might come in, and maybe that's where Michelle was thinking of it. She, um, I think management zones could be even extended into containing partial regions or partial regulatory areas, but I think that's starting to get really complicated when we have partial regulatory areas. We don't want to go there yet. My, my my thought of that is there seems to be a lot of discussion right now about even region to regulatory area. Um, maybe that's a good first step to look at those two differences, and then as future steps, maybe we think about zones. Can we reconfigure regions or zones in sort of this distribution concept? And remember, what we're talking about here is just distributing the TCUI, um, the part of the management procedure itself. Um, and keep that sort of on the back burner for now and increase complexity as we start, you know, after this tool is fully developed and becomes more in production mode and we can start investigating more and more and more and more. Thanks, Alan. Um, should we move to Tom? Tom, we can't hear you right now. Still can't hear you. I think um, he needs to unmute his computer as well. I had that problem earlier. Unmute the phone and unmute the computer. Okay, did you hear that, Tom? Unmute the phone and unmute the computer. All right, let me go up and try to unmute. There you go. There we go. We can hear you now. Oh, hang on. Now we can't hear you. Uh, he's on computer, I think. And he moved closer to his computer, we could hear him. I think he's on computer audio. Okay. Try now, Tom. Maybe not. Yeah. It says... Muted. It says you're self-muted. Tom, um, we still can't hear you. We had you for a second. We did have you for a second, though, so I don't know what happened. It doesn't look like you're muted on either your phone or the computer. It says self-muted, so make sure your phone. Yeah, I'll try, Tom. I, am I unmuted there now? There you go. Yeah. Now you got it. All right. In, in discussion with Bob Alverson in the past, he mentioned that the two A and some of you know the you know the the, the regions on the edges have always had about a 25 percent variability, and that the central region is maybe 12 to 13 percent on the FISS. With the new changes now in the with the um, the spatial temporal model and the you know the uh, the hook competition, and then going to bioregions, what has that variability been reduced to? Say, is it five or six percent now? Is it still ten to fifteen? Or I mean, how how have we how have we tightened up versus the, the variability that used to be? I mean, that that might help some of this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That's a good point. And um, Ian might want to correct me if I mischaracterize something here, but. There's two types of uncertainty we can think about when, um, in, in relation to your, your question and comment there, Tom. One is the uncertainty associated with the estimate from the fishery independent set line survey for that particular year. 
And that is the uncertainty of you going out and you're sampling a smaller group of halibut um, and you don't sample them perfectly. You don't take a census. And that's, that's sort of that within year uncertainty. There's another type of uncertainty that's going to really have a large effect on our MSC results. And that's the uncertainty from year to year that is dependent on the timing of the survey, um, where the fish just happened to be when the survey came through, what the fish were eating. You know, there, there's a lot of different things that, um, that result in a year to year uncertainty. And, and we capture that in terms of catchability in the stock assessment and changes in catchability from year to year. So I think with the spatio-temporal modeling of the survey, we're really addressing the uncertainty within the year and that's really present in the data. And Dr. Ray Webster's done a fantastic job in getting that uncertainty to be, probably be as small as we can get it, squeezing as much out of the data as we can. But what we really can't control is that difference from year to year. You know, in 2A, there's a hypoxic event in one year, and that really changes the percentage of the biomass that's estimated in that year. Is that real or is that uncertain? A lot of work to still be done on that. That's something that we really can't capture as well with the spatio-temporal modeling. So given there's quite a bit of with or between year uncertainty, I think those areas with a small percentage of biomass, you know, a very small change in biomass for 2A is going to have probably a pretty big consequence on the percentage that's estimated to be in that region. So I don't know. I, I think it still holds that at the tails of this distribution, you're going to have a bit more variability in the percentage estimated than in the core areas where that percentage is probably a little bit more constant from year to year. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there other other questions or comments? If there are so, not, I think we can turn it to. Did you have another comment, or did you want to? No, no. I was thinking about how, how we wrap this up for yeah. for uh, something for the report. Uh, is that right okay. now? Yes, that sounds good. So. Uh, I appreciate the the amount of input that folks did have for for this topic. Um, this is you know the, the first really substantive item that we've had in our agenda. I'm glad that people were able to uh, to participate as much as they were. Um, I, I think it was helpful to get um, some of the MSC's team's thoughts on how best to uh, incorporate some of these tools in the evaluation. Uh, although we did hear from folks a few times that. Uh, with respect to the specific recommendation that the distribution framework consists of X, Y, and Z, uh, that they don't really feel comfortable uh, putting forward a recommendation of, of these specific steps until um, until they've had an opportunity to see some of the results. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure where that leaves the MSE team in terms of um, what you'll do between now and the summer or whenever we have an opportunity to uh, to look at some of those results. Uh, so that's one thing I appreciate some feedback from um, Alan and all on. The other piece to flag is to uh, identify some of the maybe missing tools or additional distribution considerations that folks have flagged. Uh, we heard uh, incorporation of a, a rolling, I think it's uh, the rolling averages of the uh, estimated uh, 032 or all sizes stock distribution. Um, and then perhaps also some alternative to uh, bioregions like management zones. Adam, should I, um, can I ask that first question real quick? Yes, please. Yeah, so in, in relation to um, the element uh, or the, um, the actual method here, what, what the MSE team is really looking for from the MSAB is um, agreement and recommendation that the framework, this distribution framework, be, be moved forward. And by that, I'm meaning um, what Pierre presented here in terms of, let's see where, yeah, in terms of, of this framework itself, is that we're starting with the coast wide 
you may distribute to the regions first and then to the regulatory areas, or you may go for coastwide to the regulatory area. And, and I think that is something, you know, that we've been working with that concept, and then we've been de defining the elements that actually get you from coastwide to the regulatory area. And that, that's all that the DMSD team really needs. So I don't see any problems with what we're working on now, what we're going to be working on this summer. Um, as long as we have, you know, a table of what are the priority management procedures that the MSAB does really want to see in their evaluation, um, and we'll, we'll address that in the program of work agenda item and fleshing that out. And then also the MSC team benefits from the MSAB sort of list of tools or elements that the MSAB would like to see as part of these distribution procedures, and that's the things like the rolling averages. Make sure that's in the list, um, and, and if we want, put it at a priority level some way so that the MSE team knows how to best spend their time, which is not unlimited. It, it, there's limits to that, and that we can bring back what is you know, desired by the MSAB. So then, Alan, is it fair to say that uh, um, when you're looking for an endorsement of the, the framework, it's more that the framework has the ability to facilitate distribution to regions, but that specific step could be skipped and coastwide TCEY could go right to regulatory areas if that is the desired um, procedure? Yeah, I would say that that's a really good characterization of that, Adam, is that um, that there's that option there um, and we we may investigate it or evaluate it. So then given that, um, does that framework tie regulatory areas to those specific regions? Like the, the, trying to see if this management zone concept would fit in anywhere. So if the framework were adopted as is seen on the screen right now, but then for some reason, uh, you know, it was uh, 2A and 2B within a management zone and 2C was lumped with 3A would the framework be able to facilitate a, a new definition of region? As currently drawn on the screen, no, but we could easily uh, modify it to incorporate management zones as necessary. Okay, uh, that, that's helpful clarification for myself. Uh, Dan, I think you had a point on this. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that just going back to the slide with the recommendation on it, you could. If Alan's looking for an endorsement of what he's calling the framework, I think a little wordsmithing to this recommendation is all it would take to give him that guidance. I mean, the problem is the first sentence that says consisting of coastwide TCUI distribution to biological regions and then distributed to IPHC regulatory areas. I mean, that really is saying we're recommending the region first, but you could say a distribution framework that allows either distribution to biological regions or directly to management area uh, and all also considers relative fishing intensities, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be happy to support that type of recommendation. It's just wordsmith that paragraph and we're fine. I think on the terms of the third bullet, the tools, I think we can um, revisit that recommendation once we've gone through our section seven, you know, list of management procedures and everybody kind of identifies the ones that they really feel are important to carry forward. And at that point, we'll have all the tools on the table. That's a really uh, practical Did you, I, I missed what you said. I think we were talking at the same time, Adam. Yeah, we were. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think Dan's uh, suggestion of wordsmithing that recommendation um, will, will resolve the issue, at least as I've heard it, but I'd like to hear it from others. So are folks, uh, is anyone concerned with the idea of um, the report containing a recommendation that endorses a distribution framework um, that is a bit, uh, wordsmith a bit different than what we see on the screen right now. Something along the lines of um, recommending a distribution framework that allows for a region distribution or distribution directly to regulatory areas. I think I have one comment on that. Uh, I can let Chuck go first and then come back to me. 
Well, okay, thanks. I, uh, I guess in my case, I, I would rather hear more as we as through the rest of this meeting, whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow, but, and we'll come back to this recommendation. And if wordsmithing is going to do it, then fine. But it, uh, I just don't know that I'm ready at this particular point. I can see how that might be uh, a good thing. Um, my comment was that there is a concept that uh, we are not uh, evaluating as a management procedure right now, but that we've discussed before uh, that doesn't do use this distribution framework and that it doesn't consist of a coast-wide TCEY that's been distributed, but rather the idea that you would use uh, something like survey trend by regulatory area and you would adjust uh, the uh, TCEY by regulatory area up or down uh, just based on that survey that survey trend uh, and of course that could be applied at the level of biological region and then split out further also but um, that that idea is something that I think uh, I'm still interested in seeing as long as we're doing a management strategy evaluation where we have a model where we can just sort of see uh, how that performs uh, and um, and so that I'd like to find a way to keep that idea uh, possible and I think that's not consistent with this recommendation either. So whether we come back to that later on or discuss it further now, we've only got about seven more minutes in our session today, uh, but I just wanted to uh, raise that point. So I suppose my proposal would be uh, as we move through the agenda, and we've got more agenda items I think having to do more specifically with um, the management procedures that we have on the table right now and the framework for investigation. Um, my, my, my recommendation about this recommendation would be as for Chuck to come back to this later on in the meeting. I think we can put some draft language in the report today and then remember to come back to it. Sure, uh, as long as the draft language can um, accommodate uh, a management procedure that does not have a coastwide TCEY. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important part, Carrie. I, uh, thinking a little bit on it right now, I could understand the, <clears throat> the need to make sure that the, the frame, we're, we're not limiting ourselves too much by putting forward this recommendation early on. We, we haven't even seen results, let alone talked about other tools. So um, we, we can follow the approach we've used in the past where we've got something in yellow highlights. Um, yeah. And maybe just put a comment on it, just saying this was the concern so that we remember what it was later on. Um, I think maybe the, maybe the important part is for folks to I think what's needed for this part is the secretariat, the, the, the MSC team needs some sort of guidance from some sort of clearance from the MSAB to say, yeah, this is the framework that we want you to work within. Um, and the MSAB is concerned so that we don't want, to, yes, we're willing to provide that recommendation, but we have to make sure the recommendation is broad enough that includes all of our considerations. So we'll have to find some kind of balance in between those. Mm -hmm. Adam, if I may comment real quick on that, is um, as a member of the MSC team, I, I see it slightly differently, and m m maybe I am confusing it by putting that this or phrasing it in this way in that recommendation. Is I don't think the MSC team would, if this was a recommendation, that we would see it as this is our our boundaries that we're bounded within that. We're definitely. Um, open and been thinking about alternative ways to do that. But in terms of if we're starting with a coastwide TCY and then distributing, we're looking more like the MSE or the MSAB is in agreement that this is an acceptable framework to investigate and evaluate moving forward with the MSE. Um, we just want to make sure that we're not spending a lot of time on things that the MSAB is just a non-starter.
Yeah, I, I think that's good to understand, Alan. And, and at the same time, I think when we're doing report writing, we just need to be careful about how things will be interpreted by people in the future. Um, but that that is that's a good note. Um, yeah, I'm particularly uh, cognizant of that, given the, the, like, that this is a virtual meeting. I, I don't know if people are going to interpret things differently than if they were sitting in the room. I think it's I think for this meeting, it's more important than any other meeting that we've had to be really clear in our report about what we are uh, what we're saying. So I agree with where you're at there. Yeah. Um, well, and as a communication piece between the MSAD and the commissioners, uh, being as clear as we can, I think is a, a good thing. Um, so w with that, it sounds like we will, we've got a solution for today that will sort of uh, highlight this recommendation in yellow and sort of note uh, the pieces that we want to come back to or, or potentially wordsmith. And, um, and so in, in the next, we've got two more minutes and I'm wondering if Adam, you want to just summarize what we've been over since the, uh, since the morning break. Sure. Actually, I don't have too much more than what we've uh, we've just gone over. It's uh, you know largely seeing the the presentation from the MSE team this morning, and the the two key takeaways are uh, how we identify this recommendation for the framework, and how we uh, and whether there's additional tools that we want to identify to to be included within that. It sounds like for both of those pieces, the MSAB is. Um, we don't feel comfortable putting a, a firm recommendation forward after we've had a chance to see some of the other agenda items that are planned for um, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, I, I guess the other piece is just to see if um, uh, how folks want to kind of make use of this break time that's coming up. Um, do, do folks already have plans to, to kind of caucus during the break? Uh, do people want to use this forum or what else as co-chairs and secretary can we do to support the MSAB members over the, the rest of the afternoon before we reconvene for a report writing? Or have folks met their uh, webinar capacity as Jim pointed out earlier in the day? It, it may also be that um, people looked at the schedule before today and made other plans for the one to three o'clock period. Uh, and so if we want to plan uh, more conversations uh, in sort of the unstructured period of the day later in the week, that might be more successful than, than today. People can kind of uh, aim to keep that time free if they think that would be useful, but we could sort of let today go, uh, noting that um, there may be other plans on the table. Peggy? That's my situation right now. My kids yeah. are waiting for me outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have fun with them, Ellen. I, I envy you. Um, I'm going to be available. I don't have any plans, um, specific plans, but there's tons of things going on. So um, I will check in again at three o'clock and be available if anyone else wants to discuss any of this. Thanks. Thank you, Peggy. This is Dan. I think the most valuable use of that kind of sidebar time is going to be after we've gone through agenda item seven and, you know, actually see what are the, what are the management procedures that are made list two from list one and what are some of the ideas out there? Like Carrie just suggested a new one and I suggested rolling averages. And I think, you know, we need to get to that part of our agenda as quick as we can and then allow the space for people to have the discussions that firm up that next suite that Alan's really going to be running through the, the long simulations on. Um, so I appreciate the idea of doing that. I would bookmark maybe Wednesday during this time to try and have gotten through that agenda item seven and, and let people kind of caucus offline during that break to try and solidify ideas about what we want to move forward on. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that point, Dan, too. And um, thinking of that, are there any uh, suggestions that folks have with respect to the agenda and uh, changing anything around? I spent a bit of time this morning at the break looking at it, and I, I to be honest, don't really have any silver bullet. Um, 
I mean, one option is we could condense the agenda a little bit more, but that would make for a longer day, like more than just half a day of webinar. And I, I think productivity declines quite rapidly um, after that amount of time. Are there other suggestions about how we might make sure we've got a good chunk of time available um, to, to have the discussion that Dan was just alluding to? And if not, we'll, we'll stick with the agenda as it is. Maybe some folks can can mull over uh, during some of the unstructured time this afternoon and the evening. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, as the secretary noted earlier today, uh, we may get through some sections faster than we thought, and that would also provide some uh, some of our structured time for more discussion. Uh, and um, yeah, I almost wonder we couldn't shoot for getting to agenda item seven. Uh, at the start of Wednesday morning and get through that and see what those ideas are before we break on Wednesday. I mean, Carrie just offered one idea. I said rolling averages. Chuck has talked about adding a constraint to national shares. I mean, the sooner we as a group can put those thoughts on the table and then walk away and see, you know, how we're going to condense the management procedures in table two to continue on, I think that's the real constructive part of this meeting. And we'll take a little bit of soak time after we have that first discussion to be able to come back and start finalizing ideas. Uh, Alan, can you just let us know um, how far, I'm realizing I don't understand how far we got in the agenda today. Um, it looks like we got through 4.2, but then did we also, we did not also get through 5.1, is that correct? That's correct, we're exactly on the schedule. Um, right. Well, we're about 10 minutes behind right now, but the, um, no, we got through the management procedures part 4.2. We'd start 5.1 tomorrow. My suggestion is we take a look at the framework tomorrow. That'll be good just for understanding everything about the MSE and get that background again. Um, and then we swap six and seven. And we take mm -hmm. seven on Wednesday morning, as Dan suggested, and get through that. And the reason I'm suggesting that is the, res the preliminary results presentation right now is not going to have a big effect on our uh, uh, decision making on the, the management procedures going forward after this meeting. And we'll have the chance to then review the entire report on um, after both six and seven. So if we swap mm -hmm. seven, then do six, we still have a chance if anything does come up during then to further modify the decisions made. That sounds like a great plan to me, Alan. And, and I think tomorrow might be, you know, a full day. Th th today, half of the day was taken up with administrative stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Tomorrow we have a full four hours for the framework, and we'll, 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 we'll get through it for sure. And we might be able to start having this discussion on the program of work tomorrow. But I think Wednesday morning will be good to, as Dan said, I like the term soak time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and also I like the suggestion that uh, Wednesday might be a, a good day to use unstructured time to have uh, discussions yeah. on our own. Uh, so just keep that in mind, everybody. If, if, if you have that free, maybe keep it free uh, so that that can happen. And I'm pretty sure the go-to meeting is scheduled basically all day long until probably 5 o'clock every day. Um, mm -hmm. so. Uh, it, it, it'll be open, you know, as now we're, we're a little bit over time anyway, so, but we'll have, we have a lot of freedom in how to conduct this meeting. Okay, uh, a couple of other Great. administrative pieces is for the report writing, we'll, um, we'll all come back on here at, uh, or well, the drafting uh, group, whomever shows up for that, will come back uh, at, um, is it four o'clock, sixteen hundred? I thought it was. I thought it was three. I think it's three. Yes, is, it was. Yeah, it was fifteen hundred. You're right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And, and that's of course everybody is. It's. It's a way to have a voice in what ends up in the report, and everybody is welcome to attend that. Uh, who is an MSAB uh, member? Yeah. So similar to past years, there's um, 
uh, a template that's started or will be started for us and we'll uh, we'll fill out those pieces. I don't expect it to take the full hour, although I probably shouldn't have said that out loud, no, jinx us. Um, <laughs> but this, um, most of the administrative items today, so uh, it shouldn't be uh, too much wordsmithing given the one substantive piece of something we've already said we would highlight in yellow to, to come back to. Um, one other administrative piece is just to confirm the uh, for for those that maybe won't be back this afternoon, uh, signing in to the uh, go to session tomorrow morning. Will, will we get a new URL, uh, Alan or, or Secretariat staff, or do we use the same? No, hyperlink today? it's um, it's I'm pretty sure the link is the same. Um, what I sent one out this morning to all MSAT members, and that link should be constant for the entire week. Okay, great, thanks. So if you, if you do get a reminder email from, um, from GoToWebinar or something like that, ignore that one and use the link of what was either sent out by Aaron last week or by myself this morning as a reminder. Okay, okay great. Uh, shall, shall we wrap up? Any, any other points, Adam? Nothing else from me, aside from a very heartfelt thank you to my wife and kids for keeping the house relatively quiet on this first webinar. Um, and thank you, Adam, for and Alan, and all the rest of you who are uh, faithfully attending this meeting uh, while uh, having kids run around the house. Uh, so uh, we will see you all tomorrow morning at nine then. Uh, and I uh, hope everybody has, uh, oh, no, we won't. We'll see you at three. <laughs> well, I will see you at three tomorrow because I have another meeting this afternoon and I won't be at the report writing. Uh, but you all will see each other at three and um, for a short report writing session uh, and then we'll reconvene at nine tomorrow morning. So thanks very much, everybody. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, Adam. Um, Thank you. Yeah, all right. Bye -bye.